Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday, June 1st, 2021, Board of County Commissioners regular meeting. We'll call the meeting to order. First item of invocation and then followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll join us, please. I invite you to join with me if you're willing. Gracious Father, we begin this evening with a reminder that another hurricane season is beginning. We pray for the safety of all this season and we ask for those who may find themselves in harm's way to have a plan on the actions they will take to keep them and their families safe. We know that we may not escape the path of a storm, but we can certainly all be prepared, and we're grateful for this blue sky time to do just that. Now, as we gather this evening to conduct the community's business, may our words and our actions reflect the best that is, that is in each of us as we work together to make tomorrow better in St. Lucie County. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Once again, good evening and welcome. We trust that all of you had a safe and happy Memorial Day. And again, reflecting upon the sacrifices of our uh, men and women in uh, uniform, we again respect what they've done for us and our country and our democracy. That being said, uh, next item will be the public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board on any item that's not a public hearing, uh, now is the time to come forward and share your thoughts. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is uh, Mark DeRosa. I live at 3143 South Indian River Drive. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about a um, petition that was created by a few of us uh, on change.org. Uh, we created this petition roughly three weeks ago. I believe the start date was May 7th. Uh, in those three weeks, this petition has accumulated over 1,000 signatures, was shared over 450 times and had over 6,000 views. Uh, we spent very little effort in creating and sharing this petition, didn't spend any money to advertise it, and it was basically spread and shared by word of mouth because its message resonated with those who were viewing it. Uh, this petition asked the commission for a simple plan to lower the millage rate in St. Lucie County by a minimum of a quarter of a mil per year for a minimum of four consecutive years. Considering that St. Lucie County has the highest rate in the state of Florida out of 67 counties, while also having above average values, uh, this is a very reasonable request. Essentially, what we are asking the commission are for three things. Acknowledge that we have the highest millage rate in the state of Florida and that our citizens are overtaxed. Determine that this is a problem and that the commission wishes to address it. Make a legitimate and substantial and I repeat, legitimate and substantial effort to lower the tax burden on property owners. Uh, making this change in the millage rate is about keeping St. Lucie County affordable. We have faced nine or 10 straight years of increasing property values. We've added a sales tax and a school board tax. Insurance costs are exploding. On top of everything, we are coming out of a once in a century pandemic <laughs> event that saw many people lose their livelihoods for most of the past year. Uh, please do the right thing and give our citizens a break. Make a real effort to lower the millage rate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeRosa, uh, we appreciate your, your thoughts. Uh, I would ask you, though, that uh, you know this board only um, reflects 36% of the millage. So if you would take your uh, same argument uh, to the other 64% of the millage, that'll be helpful for us to see the end result. Okay. Thank you, Mr. DeRosa. We are under public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board? Good evening. Hmm? Carolyn Nimzik, 9620 Crooked Stick Lane, Port St. Lucie, Florida. I'm on many committees that work with the county. I'm a commercial realtor, and my business is timing. And right now, the timing is right, and everyone wants to come here. I've worked on Kings Highway for 15 years. No one wanted to come here. Now they do. So I had a couple of meetings with the county, and I said to different staff members, do you have enough staff 
to handle this because if we don't get this through in three or four or five or six months, they're going to move away. That's what happened in the past. Our business is timing and we need help. I'm also on the Infrastructure Oversight Committee, same day, two committees in one day, and we have so much going on. We have the money now. I said, do you have enough staff? Not really. You know, they, they could use more staff. Whatever they need. I mean, I, I'm against changing the millage. Right now, it's ready for development. They're going to bring in high-paying jobs. We have thousands of jobs on the line, and we have to move this forward quickly. Kat, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We are under public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board? Please remember that uh, the public hearings will be later in the meeting. So if you are here for a public meeting, public hearing, uh, we'll accept your comments then. Good evening, Hi, my sir. name is Matthew Markovsky. I'm here uh, for Waterstone Subdivision and Community Development. I know it's on the consent agenda, but I wasn't sure when I would have the opportunity to talk if you guys took it off the consent agenda and started discussing it. I wanted to let you know that I'm here to answer any questions okay, that well, you guys may have. I didn't know which... If it, I can do it, it on the consent agenda or now or how it works. It is in the consent agenda, but I'll ask you to give us your comments now, and then if there are additional questions, um, they can. I, I, I don't have any comments unless, for some reason, you guys have comments regarding if it's taken off the consent agenda. Okay, it's a little unusual, but I will, I will hold your, I will keep you in mind when we get to that. I appreciate it. Okay, Thank you. you got it. We are under public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board? Good evening, sir. If you'll just let us know who you are for the record. Hello, my name is Jeff Miller. Uh, I'm the broker and owner of Management Specialists. We're one of the larger uh, annual property managers here in San Luis County. I'm also the vice president of the San Luis County Landlord Association. Um, graduate of Lincoln Park. Uh, thank you for having me here. Basically, I'm just up here to voice my concern as well with our high property taxes. It's affecting our rents. It's, um, it's affecting everything. Uh, Prices are up, everything's up. You have your sales tax revenue, you have your federal funds from COVID that came in. At what point do we start to see some property tax relief from the county level? The city's doing it, they're doing a great job. All we're asking, I know you have a lot going on in the county, but there's a lot of money here, there's a lot of money flowing, we gotta get some type of discount. We're not looking for a slash or you know ruin any services. Port St. Lucie's been able to do it and they, they do very well within their budget. So I basically just came here today, tired from work, just to come out here and tell you guys, please, think about it, do something about it. If it's not done, then we're just gonna keep going. We're gonna, we're gonna have to find someone that can. And that's where we're at, okay? I appreciate it, and I also thank you for all your hard work. I know you guys work hard. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Miller, if I may add my same comment I did yes, for Mr. Sir. DeRosa, is that uh, this board uh, controls only 36% or has an interest in 36% of the uh, millage. If you would take, take your same comp uh, uh, comments to the other remaining 64% of the millage, uh, those who are responsible for it. I will, but we, will you also reduce on your 33 or 36%? That's, that's what we'll be talking about very soon, in our, and we appreciate your comments now. That's what I appreciate. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Sir. Take care. All right. And ladies. We are under public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board? Please go. Don't be shy, folks. Come on up. If you want to come up, you can kind of queue up here on the side, and we appreciate that. Good evening, sir. Let us know who you are for the record. I'm Drew Reitman. Uh, I'm a resident here and also a, a landlord. I'm here with uh, supporting Mark Rosa and his group. Um, <clears throat> I own properties here. And I, I guess I reiterate everything he said. I mean, I don't quite understand why Port St. Lucie has the highest tax rate in, of all the counties in Florida. I just don't get it. Um, but so, you know, I, and it doesn't really make too much sense. I mean, you have development over there at Riverland and all through tradition. And a lot of those communities are signed up with bonds. And so the infrastructure is being supported by the developers. And a lot of these people that are moving in to Riverland, and these other communities have no children. They're coming down from the north. So the, the idea of having a tax base for schools, uh, so a little bit of that ar argument, you know, loses its uh, steam. 
Um, so I, I basically want to know why why is it so uh, expensive to have these taxes so high in this community? I don't I, I don't quite understand it. I mean, if it was a, you know Miami Beach or you know someplace you know maybe over Naples, Florida or something, but why out of all of the uh, counties, uh, Port St. Lucie has the highest rate? I, you know. So anyway, that's my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. And I, I will just make a correction. That I know, I know exactly what nope, you're going to say. No, I'm not going to say the same thing. Actually, I'm going to go different on it. Uh, to correct the record, Port St. Lucie, uh, specific as its own municipality, is not the highest tax in the, in the, in the uh, state. St. Lucie County does have the highest millage, but it's, it's a come up. <coughs> excuse me. Come, there. Try that again. <laughs> It's a combination of a number of taxing districts, but I would like to invite you to the Citizens Academy here in St. Lucie County with the next class. So um, that'll actually give you more of an insight as to what and how uh, the taxes are uh, levied and where those taxes go and a lot about what we do in the community and who's responsible for what, whether it's City of Fort St. Lucie, City of Fort Pierce, or St. Lucie County Unincorporated. Okay, thank you very much. We are under co uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to address the, the board? Don't be shy. Come on up. Uh, we can queue up, line up, and we'll move right along. Good evening, sir. I recognize you. Thor Welcome back. Haven, 4101 South Indian River Drive. When you say this other 64%, who is that? Well, let's see. You talked about the school district, Fort St. Lucie, if you're in, if in, if you're in the city of Fort St. Lucie, or Fort Pierce, the water districts, um, fire, fire district, um, I have to look at all the South rest of the list. Water South Florida Water Management, management District, North St. Lucie Water Erosion, Management District. Sustainable. Uh, so there are quite a few. If you look at your, um, pardon? This, yeah, the CDDs are really probably one of the bigger uh, issues that it's, it looks like it's a tax uh, coming from the county, but it's actually from the developer that created the Community Development District. So if you look at your if you look at your tax notice, there's a whole list. Uh, the county is responsible for uh, the sheriff's uh, millage, the uh, mosquito control right. erosion district, uh, general fund, uh, fine and forfeiture. So that'll give you a better idea. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you, sir. We are still under public comment. Seeing no move. I thought I saw somebody move. Seeing no movement, we'll come back to the board. Um, next item will be the approval of the minutes. We have several sets of minutes. The first being uh, for the joint meeting uh, of May 6, 2021. The other uh, next meeting was the BOCC regular meeting, May 4th, 2021. The BOCC informal meeting of May 11, 2021. And the BOCC regular meeting of May 18th. If there are no uh, corrections, mm -hmm. additions, deletions, I'll accept a motion. Move approval. We have a motion by Bart. Second. Second by Hutchinson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Hearing no nays, we'll move right along. All right, next item is the uh, consent agenda. And a couple of things before we get started on the consent agenda. Um, item 8J1 was pulled prior to the meeting. Um, let's see. Uh, if you're waiting for the erosion district, uh, there was an item uh, pulled from that uh, public works B, uh, consent agenda 4B2. So if you're waiting for uh, erosion, that one was pulled. And um, are there any items that the commissioner would like to pull for uh, conversation or separate vote? I'd like to pull uh, I1. 8 I1. Sir, for discussion, Waterstone PUP phase four. Okay. Well, before we get to that, I'll make a note of that. Anyone else have anything for separate vote or discussion? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll wait uh, for anything else. I'm going to at this time. I'd like to pull 8D6. I see that uh, Mr. Uh, Pete Tesh is in the audience, and this is a good news story. And if if I could uh, get the support of the board to pull this, and and Mr. Tesh, would you like to come forward and? Kind of share some thoughts about this item. I think it's really important that when we have great things, and I held off uh, introducing our guests, so I'm going to leave that to you since you asked specifically to do it. So, 
just so you know i didn't thank thank you mr chairman good evening mr chairman members of the commission mr tipton i'm p tesh president of the economic development council of st lucie county uh thanks for having us uh here this evening and uh, putting us up front uh we have great news to share with you uh very important announcement uh in terms of business attraction and having a a uh, very preferred employer uh, coming to our community. Uh, really appreciate the, the economic development partnership that we have with you, and there's um, many people that are making this possible this evening. Uh, of course, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Jill Marasa, our VP of Business Retention and Expansion, and she does all the fabulous PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> the e economic impact analysis, and uh, project management, and so much more. Um, also, I'd like to thank Peter Jones and uh, Heather Young that helped us get here this evening with the resolution. Appreciate the hardworking staff of the county. Uh, we have uh, some special guests with us today uh, with uh, our economic development partnership from the city of Port St. Lucie. And uh, we're very blessed to have uh, Vice Mayor Shannon Martin with us uh, this evening. All right. And uh, thanks for coming. Vice Mayor Martin is accompanied by the city manager of Port St. Lucie, uh, Russ Blackburn, and the CRA director, uh, Wes McCurry. Uh, again, I have uh, just a fascinating PowerPoint presentation <laughs> and also um, deliberate uh, on the economic impact analysis from Implan, but uh, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to ask uh, Warren Newell, uh, the director of development for this great project, which is Project Bullet, and uh, I would uh, allow uh, Mr. Newell to come up and make the announcement. Warren. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, Commission. Uh, it's, it's hard to follow Pete because he usually takes all the uh, the excitement and all the information I want to talk about, but he didn't do it tonight, <laughs> which is pretty cool. But yeah. I, I did forget something when I came uh, tonight. I you know, I came up and I said, I, I should have brought the spreadsheet that Jill did for me when I first got to talk to her about the economics of the project. And if you haven't seen it or heard it, I will somehow make a copy of it if I can figure out how to fit it on <laughs> the copy machine. It was honest to goodness, it was like nine feet long. And by the time you start and you go out to the end, I was completely confused. And I figured it was the whole process between Wes and Jill and Pete was to confuse me. And that works pretty well. <laughs> but I'll be short, and uh, it's a great honor to be here tonight um, to uh, announce that Cheney Brothers is uh, coming to, if I say it right, St. Lucie County in Port St. Lucie. And um, we're really happy with this opportunity to build a new distribution center here and uh, hire a lot of employees and pay them good salaries here in St. Lucie County. You know, it's funny, I've been doing this since the early 70s, and I don't want to tell you how old I am, but uh, that's the honest to goodness truth, and, and Sean will, uh, will uh, confirm that. I've been around a long time. But it's great to have new projects to announce, and that's the cool part. So and for the last 18 months, Cheney Brothers has been working on this project and with some great staff, both at the city and the county. And, of course, we were moving forward, and we were actually way, be, way ahead of Sandstone on their projects. And then COVID hit, and as we all recognize, restaurants were one of the hardest hit in the business community. So we had some tough times to get through. But that's a, that sort of passed us, and we are um, now hitting some of the most prosperous months in the business history. So it's pretty cool, and I'm just sort of lucky and proud to be a part of it. You know, the company started in 1925, um, the Cheney family, and uh, Byron Russell, the CEO and chairman, continues that family tradition in West Palm Beach, and we originally started delivering eggs and milk to the Breakers Hotel and a few other little restaurants that were developing in the uh, West Palm Beach area. But today we uh, are across the southeast, uh, many facilities in Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia, and we service over 100 different countries from our facilities. We handle 16,000 different products, and um, it's really a cool company from the standpoint of when we build the facility, other companies sort of follow right behind us and uh, try to locate the same vicinity, whether it be Ryder Trucks or Penske or somebody else who follows with our company. The facility planned and 
Uh, Port St. Lucie is 427,000 square feet, the initial phase. It'd be expandable up to 600,000 square feet. Uh, we anticipate to hire 380 jobs initially when we get oper fully operational. It won't be the first day, but as we get fully operational. And then when total build out, there'll be close to probably 600 jobs there. In the uh, Punta Gorda facility, which is almost a very similar facility I built, um, gosh, over six years ago, we not only exceeded those job <coughs> amounts, we exceeded them three years early, uh, which was a tremendous and of course, the economic development director was very happy because we, uh, we exceeded those numbers. Of course, COVID hit, we went back a ways, but now we're, we're catching back up. It's a refrigerator freezer facility. It's a concrete tilt wall. And it's, when I say hurricane resistant, when you have your normal building codes in the state of Florida, they're by different districts, different areas due to the hurricane impacts. Our buildings are built beyond those qualities, those standards. The reason is we have to be operational during hurricanes. We don't shut down because the food still needs to go to Orlando or Melbourne or wherever it is. Plus, we have to service all the fire rescue, EMS, law enforcement, because they're also part of our service contracts we provide. We're on the ground before FEMA even shows up. We're out there with ice, water, and food for the uh, communities. <clears throat> There's not a whole lot more to talk about now because we're still in the process of uh, working on the site planning and developing the, the actual project and the layouts and, and um, Hopefully, I'll be resolved soon. But I did want to give a shout out to some people like Jill, Wes, Russ, both the city and the county, elected officials, and all the people who have been helping us through this process. Did I say Pete? You <laughs> <laughs> did now. Uh, uh, he's used to it, Warren. <laughs> I know he is. You know, he, he actually uh, worked on a project in the uh, Orlando area we had years ago. So, Pete, do Cheney Brothers, right? from working with us then, so. But it's been a team effort, uh, all of us working together, and it's really gonna be a great facility, not only Cheney to be proud of, but also the community elected officials. It's gonna be a long-term project. So we hope to look forward to breaking ground soon, and uh, we gotta order a bunch more trucks, so it's gonna be cool. So here for any questions, to answer anything. So, but, you're, so your official announcement is Cheney Brothers is coming to St. Lucie County. It is, for sure. <laughs> and I will have to say, you're going to start wearing red shirts here pretty soon. So okay. I didn't wear mine, but Jill wore her color. Red yeah, she's over here. Me, so. Any questions from the board for Mr. Newell? No, I would say welcome to St. Lucie County. Yeah. And Look just to put to it, it in a proper perspective, what's the size of the one that's in Riviera Beach? How many square Pull feet your is microphone that? over. That's 295,000 square feet. And this feet. is 427,000. Yes, it is. To start. It's a big project. To start. Right. And that's Six. right north of the Decker. FedEx distribution center. That's correct. That's worth FedEx on against the interstate on the west side. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Newell. And so this is where I talk about the relationship between Port St. Lucie and St. Lucie County and the fact that we have uh, the outside world has looked at what we have done as government agencies working together, that cooperation, that cooperative spirit, being able to bring these types of developments forward. And so I expect that your your Statements so far have been very clear to say that the relationships and, and your effort working through both uh, have been excellent. I have to add to that, Chairman. It, if you don't have the economic groups there, it's difficult for a person like myself to understand, even though I've been in the, been in the business my whole life, the SADs, the CRAs, the, the, uh, you know, all the different uh, special taxing districts that exist, whether it be MSTU, you name it, it's difficult. And if you don't have the people who are first in it, who deal with it every day, and if Wes ever leaves, we are all in trouble, <laughs> because, um, uh, and he knows that too, because it, it is difficult to go through all this, and this project and property is extremely complicated, uh, just because of what the history of it, and we all know that mm -hmm. uh, up here, so um, it is, it's critical to have those people in the right position to be able to make those communication and call, and I do this all around the country, at least in the southeast, and some cities and some counties are extremely helpful, other ones, they just there's no help at all. And we need that help because every time it takes one more phone call to the planning, zoning, and building department to get one more answer, there's another day delayed, another week, another month, and that adds up to cost and dollars. So it's critical to have the people in the economic development who can assist us get through the processes as quickly as possible. And Sandstone's a perfect example. They, they talk about it all the time. This relationship between the county and city has just been phenomenal. I mean, it's just... 
it's amazing how good it is. Thank you, Mr. Noel. We appreciate that. And we're all waiting for this lovely PowerPoint. We're going to see you that uh, <laughs> we can do that that groundbreaking, hopefully uh, not too long. Hopefully, all right. Sure. So. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you so much and welcome. Appreciate it. Mr. Tesh. Uh, thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm all choked up. Uh, thank What's you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate Warren coming up here and uh, talking about this great business uh, coming to town. A, a couple of uh, items, and uh, I'm happy to dispense with a PowerPoint presentation if that would help. Thank you. <coughs> up to the board. Mm -hmm. you're, okay, you're okay with that? It, it, Unless you have a pretty picture of the, of the, the drawings. We have it, but uh, never mind. We're good. You, you have a long evening. Yes, uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing us to come before you. Just a couple of other items. Uh, on June 14th, on around June or June 14th, um, the city of Port St. Lucie, the governmental finance corporation, and the city will uh, present the uh, contract as well as uh, deliberate upon um, their portion of the incentive package. So we're before you this evening um, to uh, ask for a business assistance and incentive package. Uh, from St. Lucie County, we're looking at a 10-year ad valorem tax exemption and uh, also the job growth investment grant uh, for 380 uh, high-wage, high-skilled jobs. Those jobs paying uh, $55,000 or more, which is 135% uh, of St. Lucie County's average earnings per worker. Uh, on or around uh, June 14th, uh, the City of Port St. Lucie will do the same thing with their package. Uh, that will include uh, expedited uh, site plan review and fast track permitting, uh, their portion of the ad valorem tax exemption, and then also impact fee mitigation. So that is um, the package in its entirety, and uh, we uh, would very much appreciate your favorable consideration of that. And Mr. Chairman. Tesh, this is where I ask you the question. You know, we, we've uh, seen the challenges of the past and decades past. Uh, this is not a cash giveaway of taxpayer dollars or any other suppl supplement uh, such as that. This is performance-based, and if these investments do not happen, those, those tax abatements and other uh, job grant incentives uh, do not go across the board. Is that correct? Yes, sir. This is a performance-based grant. They have to build the building. They have to occupy it. Uh, they have to hire the people. Uh, those uh, workers must be employed uh, for a considerable period of time to uh, gain the uh, job growth investment grant. Again, this comes at a tremendous uh, return on investment to the county and the community with a total economic output of $82 million. So this is, um, this is great for our community. And uh, in terms of creating um, sustainable jobs for our family and residents, uh, I, I can't think of a better company than Cheney Brothers Inc. to have here. So great corporate citizen. And um, you know, we're just overjoyed that uh, they're going to join uh, this great business community. And this is a good example of, of the, the taxpayer-approved tax abatement, which gives us a, a leverage <coughs> in, the, in the other uh, communities that are trying to take away these types of businesses, these jobs, these investments in their communities. Now, this is a, a, a tool that we use to compete, not only in the state, but actually across the country. Uh, and so this is a taxpayer tax uh, voter referendum that was created uh, for the tax abatement, which is a tool that we get to use uh, to, to bring these types of businesses and this investment, $82 million, uh, that wouldn't be coming here if these tax abatement uh, components were, were not provided. Is that, is that accurate? It's a, a very accurate assessment, sir. And uh, over 300 jobs to start, 380 jobs to start, and it'll only go from there. So the last question is, uh, Mr. Newell, I know that I've seen the advertisements that you're already looking for uh, employment, uh, folks for, to be employed. Uh, so we'll direct them to Career Resource uh, Center, uh, and uh, those jobs are immediately available uh, to start uh, getting over to Cheney Brothers. Okay? Anything thank else? you, sir, and uh, thank you. Anything else from the board? Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tesh. Okay, under the consent agenda, is there any other items, Commissioner, like Mr. to pull? Mr. Chair, would you like to call the, um, for a motion on accepting the 
follow up on the presentation, or are you going to just do it s well, as a total with the consent? No, let's do it. Let's do it separately. I like the Thank idea you. of that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, it, you've heard the the uh, presentation. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the consent program. We have a motion by Hutchinson, second by Mitchell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, and again, back to the consent agenda. I do want to pull one just for a point to point out um, and highlight 8L3. It's an infra infrastructure sales tax item. Uh, it's the FEC fees for Edwards Road crossing. Uh, we always want to talk about the uh, sales tax provisions. Uh, and uh, and let people know that we are using those wisely. All right, if there are no other items, I hear 8I1 is one being pulled for discussion. Um, Mr. Mitchell. Okay. <clears throat> After discussing the long history of this PUD with staff and surrounding residents, I, I do have concerns with the promise to bring the landscape uh, requirements into compliance. Several times in the past, promises have been made by the developer with regards to issues with the berm, fence, plantings, maintenance, and we, not, we didn't address them until the 11th hour to obtain future board approval for the next phase. With the current state of the real estate boom, I have concerns not only with this development not conforming with the PUD approval, but these coming to our community. St. Lucie County should maintain the high level of standard of review and approval for all developments to ensure their property values and quality of life have, as they have invested in. Any other comments on this item? Mr. Chair, Commissioner, um, Commissioner Mitchell, um, normally I would agree with that, okay, but I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Over the past year, we've all lived through and had to try to survive many of our businesses on even having employees to do some of the work that you described. And a lot of those companies couldn't find people to work and or they couldn't work, whatever the case may be. There's also, as we're all well aware, a huge um, demand for landscaping with all the building that's going on, not just in St. Lucie County, but statewide. So the landscaping material is not probably the best because the growers too have had issues with having labor force out there, but also because of the demand. It's just not there as good as it was for a while. You know, it's that big rush on there. So when in my conversations with staff today, because I shared your concerns you know, basically voicing the same thing that you were saying. I'm willing to go for this one because it's my understanding they've been actively out there working it, trying to get that, and they've been being checked on. Moving forward with the plat doesn't mean that we can't still keep their feet to the fire because we can still follow up with that when it comes into the final stuff. So seeing that there's a good faith effort being made and understanding what everyone has had to go through over the past year, I'd be willing to move forward with this, with the caveat that um, that staff will be out there checking, which is my understanding they have been, so. I would just like, is the developer here? I have no uh, idea. Yes. Yeah, hold, would, okay. Hold, hold on. No, no. I'll, I'll wait. Hold on a second. Let, let, go ahead and just make your statement and I'll, I'll have them come up if you can. I, I just want to know what kind of assurances that can they give us that they'll bring the, we have issues that are, are not in compliance now that weren't in the past. How can you bring those into compliance and maintain these in the future? And I certainly understand what Commissioner uh, uh, Hutchinson said. We went through a pandemic. We're coming out of that. The governor just stopped where you're not going to get the extra unemployment. I believe that'll bring more people to the table to go to work. But I'm looking long range, not just today, not next week, but over the many years that we've got to. I've said this in the past that we sometimes we'll, we'll, we issue COs and then after we give them their COs, they'll break down and do things that they put up and take them back down again. We can't continue to do those things. And I certainly understand that there are material problems, but they're not going to be forever. So I, I'm just concerned that the way this has been rolled out in the past and things that have done in the past, I don't want to see the same thing going forward. So I do have concerns. You can stand there for a minute. I have some questions of staff first. 
Uh, Commissioner Townsend. I, I just want to say, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, um, this has a long history, yeah. and and currently the contractor that's there that's back, what they have proceeded forward since they've been back doing, they have done a great job. They've went in, they've cleaned it up, they've done the landscaping, they have a relationship with the neighbors. Um, I don't know if you've drove by and saw the project, I'm sure you have because you're north of county a lot, but, um, and the comfort that I have in this is I, I am familiar with where it began. I know when it went south, I know when it's been picked back up again. I know the relationships with one of the neighbors that they've had that they've worked through. I have seen nothing but this project moving forward. I have drove through the project. Um, there's people living in there for the first time. And the comfort I have in all of this is they're not going to get anything finalized until our ERD department is out there right. and signs off on everything. So they're going to make sure our environmental department that everything is c compliant before they sign off on everything. So that's the comfort I have outside the fact of seeing how this project has moved forward since they've been back and been moving forward the project over the last year and even during the pandemic of that. So I'm comfortable with moving forward with this. And to staff, uh, can you tell us from the historic standpoint when the entitlements of this uh, property and this development came through? Chair Zadovsky, members of the board, uh, the Emerson Estates, uh, also known as Waterstone Project, was authorized in 2003. Uh, some of the infrastructure was, uh, began in uh, 2005. Uh, four townhomes were built in 2008, uh, and then the project was dormant for nearly a decade. Uh, the current applicant, which, which is a collection of uh, the developer, uh, the CDD, and the proposed home or townhome builder, um, the, the developer acquired the property in late 2018 and has been working with staff uh, over the, the past two and a half, uh, nearly three years, and, and uh, working to bring the site into compliance because uh, although there was a lot of landscaping, berms, uh, and, and infrastructure installed over a decade ago uh, with, with anything, uh, 10 years of no maintenance, no watering, uh, no attention, uh, things can certainly fall and, and to the wayside and out of compliance. Uh, so gradually they've been working to uh, shore things up, install landscaping, and again, the, the condition of approval that staff's recommending this evening would require successful inspection of all the landscaping, including the south berm, buffering this project from some estate density, single family, but also the new plantings that uh, have begun as of this morning along Emerson Avenue or 27th Street. Is that where the fence is? Uh, there's uh, a fence required along the, the southern uh, boundary. I believe it's uh, well over 2,000 uh, linear feet of uh, fencing along what the southern What kind of boundary. fencing would that be? Uh, I believe it's a six-foot-tall wood fence. Wood. And uh, to, to uh, Chair Zadovsky's um, inquiry into the original approval, the uh, active resolution from 2003 requires the construction, installation, and perpetual maintenance of that south barrier, the it, it consists of a berm, a fence, and landscaping. Uh, the resolution didn't specify the material. Uh, therefore, the staff in implementing that resolution from 2003 allowed the discretion of uh, material to the developer. Uh, of course, uh, wood requires more maintenance, uh, more frequent maintenance than masonry wall, uh, but I believe due to the linear distance uh, ABC. Yes, that the, the applicant has installed a, a stockader or wood fence. And landscaping. Commissioner, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, you know, reminding me about the fence. You know, it's nearly a mile long. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, oh. So, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So, uh, when you talk about the CDD and uh, a, a, something that has been in place for more than ten years, uh, well, let me first ask the question: um, How did they? How did this? PUD continued to have its entitlements after a 10-year dormancy. Was that because of the recession? I can't remember, um, and I don't they, know. The uh, state provided that. Yeah, no, they kept rolling. Yeah, it. I just didn't know how the 10 years was a long time for that. Chair Zadovsky, members of the board, the approval order in 2003, uh, subsequently <clears throat> the installation of infrastructure, and there was a phase one plat issued for the first set of single family homes, uh, single family lots, even though the lots weren't developed upon, they were platted, uh, which leads to vesting of the project. And also 
within the townhome section, I believe there to be roughly 16 uh, townhome lots that were platted, four of which uh, units were constructed in 2008, uh, thus vesting the, the project. And again, uh, coupled with some of the uh, development order extensions that the state provided over time, uh, the, the project uh, remains uh, active. Uh, since the developer took ownership in late 2018, uh, the sections of the single family uh, platted area or the single family approved area have been platted. Homes have been built by Adams Homes and Kehov Nanian uh, and immediate inspections of landscaping, stormwater areas associated with supporting those homes have been completed. Uh, actively uh, in, in coordination with our Environmental Resources Department, we're working on uh, preserve area, monitoring and maintenance, ensuring that invasives are cleared out and that there's monitoring to ensure that the, the habitat and ecosystem are maintained. But certainly uh, after 10 years of uh, dormancy in the project, it, it's been an active two years uh, trying to uh, coordinate compliance and ensure that uh, all the, the landscape installation occurs, uh, restoration of the fence and monitoring of, of ensuring that irrigation works, uh, ensuring that, that things are done in, in, uh, in as much compliance with the original 2003 approval as possible, uh, but certainly it, it, uh, as recommended in our condition that there's certainly uh, additional time that we anticipate the developer and the applicant to continuously implement uh, and improve the, the project uh, to, to meet our expectations and county standards. Well, I do have a challenge. Well, first of all, let me just ask another question. The CDD, under the CDD, what's all involved in the CDD? Just the road, the drainage, the sidewalks, the the uh, infrastructure, water, sewer, what's all under the CDD? Do you have that information? Uh, Commissioner, I, I can't say with absolute certainty all the parameters uh, the CDD, but I understand the uh, utilities, the roadway infrastructure, and the support stormwater areas, which would include the littoral plantings, uh, and I do believe the CDD also would cover the preserve areas, the upland preserves. Uh, I imagine it's a combination of the HOA and CDD for long-term maintenance of the uh, landscape buffers along the north, east, south, and west sides uh, abutting the, the perimeter of the property. And see, this is my concern. Uh, something that has been, uh, the entitlements were provided in 2003. You had some changes in 2008. You have somebody comes on 2018. The CDD is is created to actually pay for the infrastructure. Uh, after a 10-year period, 17-year period, w whichever sections have been coming and, and, and being uh, put in the ground, uh, the end of life periods come along. So if you're if you're buying in, you're in the HOA, and what happens when you have to repave the road, or if you have to pull up the the uh, the, the sewer pipes or the water pipes, uh, does that then become a, an HOA assessment? So I'm trying to protect the, the future homeowners in this regard as to where are we at with the CDD and what's the cost to, the, to those who are buying the home <laughs> and are they going to be assessed again uh, for, for any uh, things that have to be improved because of that situation? Uh, Chair Zadowski, members of the commission, uh, the, there's two components, I, I think. As far as the rates of CDD assessments, I would uh, need to defer to the, the applicant as to those current rates. but. Um, the sentiment shared regarding uh, the condition of the infrastructure, utilities, um, was also shared by staff when the developers first met uh, with us a couple years ago, uh, in which uh, staff has uh, required uh, inspections of the utility lines prior to activation in coordination with St. Louis County Utilities uh, regarding the roadway condition and their lifespan, because again, if, if roads were installed in 2005, 2000 six with a 20 or 25 year life expectancy, you would think, wow, you know, fast forward to 2021, you have half, half the shelf life remaining. Uh, so that the, our uh, staff team is coordinated with the developer on a subdivision improvement agreement associated with each phase of the plat uh, and surety associated with that to secure funds or guarantees uh, that uh, in the foreseeable future, that all the roadway infrastructure sidewalks that, that are remaining will either be installed, recertified, overlaid uh, to ensure that when everything is turned over fully uh, to either uh, you know phasing out of the CDD to the HOA or the next phase of the CDD that uh, we have some control over um, the condition of the infrastructure uh, carried forward. 
Any other questions from the board before I ask a question of our, our attorney? Mr. Mr. McIntyre, um, this was a consent agenda item. Uh, a considerable amount of information and questions have been asked by the board and provided staff uh, with uh, a response. And the, ap the applicant is here. I uh, he suggested that give him an opportunity to respond to some of this. Now, should I be moving this into a public hearing context or? I'm not sure how I should proceed just leaving it in this context. Well, it, it hasn't been advertised as a public hearing. That's my so question. We're, we're not in a position really to do that. Um, I do think it is appropriate to allow the developer to answer questions that the board has raised, and that's, that's a fair thing. Uh, I guess it's up to the board if there's other folks in the audience that would like to speak about it. That's up to the board, but it would not be a public hearing in any sense because it's not advertised. It's not it's just, required to be a public hearing. Well, it's, un, it's, it's unusual. That's why I'm trying right. to get it clarification is. so I maintain this yes, side sir. of the equation. Yes, sir. But it was pulled and the board had questions. Okay. There has been extended discussion, including staff. So I think it is appropriate to uh, ask the developer to respond and it may lead to further questions. Okay. Anything else from the board before I ask the developer? To... Good evening, sir. Please tell us who you are for the record. My name is Matthew Markovsky. I'm with the Waterstone Community Development District, as well as Waterstone Holding Investments. You've heard a lot here tonight. Um, do you want to respond to what you have heard so far? Uh, um, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a history of okay. the uh, Waterstone development. Like Corey said, uh, I wasn't around in 2005. I took over in 2018. We bought the property from the Waterstone Community Development District, who foreclosed on the previous developer. <clears throat> So since I've come in in 2018, we put in $3 million, in excess of $3 million for the recreational area. There's a whole new rec building, tennis courts, pickleball courts, uh, volleyball courts. Um, we, we put in the new fence. We did elect to use wood, but the existing fence was made out of wood from 15 years ago, was deteriorated to the point where we replaced the entire fence with a brand new fence. Um, the landscaping along the southern uh, property line, um, we, we put in all the new landscaping, spent $150,000. Yes, I did do it last minute because I wasn't aware of it prior to my previous plat. Just like on Emerson along Emerson, I wasn't aware that the beds were existing 15 years ago, that they deteriorated to the point where there was nothing left. And the reason why they deteriorated, the previous developer had no irrigation along Emerson Avenue. So when Corey told me about this, and I, I said I'd try to get it done before the June 1st meeting, it became impossible because all last week, we replaced the master irrigation lines along the southern and the front of the property on Emerson. So once, it didn't make sense to plant hundreds of thousands of dollars of plants with no irrigation, right? So once that was done, they have started today, they've already planted 1,500 of the required 8,500 plants, and I do anticipate them being done by Thursday, with all the requirements along Emerson, and we will call Amy Cooper from the ERD to inspect at that time. Um, as far as uh, the approval of this plat, this is the only uh, multifamily section in the uh, Waterstone subdivision. So I really would like to get the plat approved so we can start our models and start going out there. Um, I still have other lots that are unplatted. I'll be back in front of you guys for plat five and six which is the uh, KHAV product. Um, this is the final of the Adams homes to be platted, so they'll all be platted after today. Um, the concern <coughs> about the Waterstone Community Development District. So it was in trouble <coughs> before we got in. Now that we've got in, the lakes have been met with South Florida Waterman District, littoral shelves, the, um, the roadway is in dis disrepair. We've, we've patched it to the best of our ability. We don't want to replace the roadway because we're building 720 homes in there, and it doesn't make sense. You're just going to have everything ripped up. Right. So uh, we did make, uh, do a subdivision improvement agreement with David Hayes' department. We've given $350,000 of a cash in cash so far. Um, it's going to be in excess of a half a million dollars because we're going to have to put in more money for plats five and six. So they're doing the roadway per plat is where I have to put in my money. Um, the CDD has reserves. It will be collecting reserves. When the roadway does need to be completed, uh, the CDD will complete the roadway. 
Um, as far as the homeowners that come in, the 720 of them get an uh, annual budget. They're invited to the monthly CDD meetings. They're all aware of uh, what's going on and the expenses to each line item. Uh, we are replacing the current landscaper there with someone who's local. Uh, the, but the annual contract is $200,000. They will be maintaining the southern perimeter of the new landscaping as long, along with the landscaping installed on Emerson. Um, we have a separate uh, Ecotech Environmental who will be uh, monitoring the three preserves. They are scheduled next week to go out there and do the uh, exotic removal. Uh, from there on, they have a, a contract on a quarterly basis to do their maintenance. Um, the CDD is very healthy. It's got uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in there right now between the operating and maintenance and the uh, reserves. And since we've come in, we've obviously contributed. We, we're paying not shortfall, so we're a CDD. Every lot that we own, we're paying our proportionate share to the CDD. Uh, the CDD will be responsible for everything in the association. There is a homeowners association for the uh, master, which is $40 a year, which basically covers the management company and insurance. And then we are doing a sub-association for the townhome section, which will also have their own uh, recreational facility and swimming pool strictly for the townhome section. So they'll have their own maintenance <coughs> because we're doing a, a master insurance policy. If uh, we're doing a painting reserve, the buildings need to be painted. We're making it more senior friendly to be um, uh, fully manicured. The lawns and everything are gonna be maintained in the townhome section. So they'll have their own private HOA. Well, I can appreciate that you don't think <coughs> putting a brand new road in right now while you're doing construction is, is the way to go. But I do have concerns that the CDD and those who are going to be buying the homes uh, or the townhomes or whatever the, the uh, quality uh, is being uh, touted uh, is that after the fact they're going to be charged or given an assessment of far and above what the CDD uh, would the, be charging today. The, yeah, they won't be charged a special assessment. The, the, the reserves <coughs> on an annual basis, we've done a reserve study, will cover the cost of the roadway. So it's like Corey said, we still have about seven to 10 years from it. From that, we'll have plenty of cash flow <laughs> In the bank too, are you uh, are you familiar the with the previous the the original developer Shelby Homes? Am I? I'm sorry. Are you familiar with the original developer Shelby Homes? As far as I know, Shelby Homes yeah. was never involved in this subdivision. Uh, then it must be a different Waterstone. <coughs> but anyway, I will reserve my comment then if it's it's not. If you're yeah, not I, uh, the the original uh, developer was um, Dick Siemens of the Siemens Group. Okay, and then and and then he uh, sold it to. Uh, the Evans Group and KB Home, and then they developed it. They're the ones who put the CDD bond on it. And then 2005, <laughs> six, seven, the crash came. They left the subdivision. The CDD foreclosed on them. The CDD has owned it for that 12 to 13 years, and I, uh, we bought it from the CDD. The four townhomes that were built in there were built by Miranda Homes, and the CDD sold them four lots to try to make it go out of it in 2007 and eight, then the market crashed, and they left after just building four townhomes. Right. Well, I don't have much to say about the, the site plan because I didn't have a chance to, to do anything about it since it was approved in 2003, but I'm just gonna suggest to you, the amount of density in this property, uh, you may wanna think you know, <coughs> the quality of life for the people who are gonna be buying these, these properties. It's incredibly dense with very little in the way of um, uh, amenities and things like that, open space. So just a, a Again, I don't have a say-so in it. It was approved in 2003 and, and continued to be uh, brought forward. So um, anything else from the board for uh, Mr. Mer Ma'am, no. Um, that's why I'm having a little trouble with... Ma'am, no. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. McIntyre, um, we talked about it, uh, and so if there are people here who'd wish to speak to some of this, I, I can let them come to the podium. Yes, that's, that's uh, within the chair's discretion and the board's at okay. this point. All right. Um, sir, if you'll just have a seat for a moment, sure. I'm going to uh, open the podium for those who might be here to have uh, comments or questions of the board. Uh, and you'll ask your questions and, and make your statements to us, and then we will relay the questions to uh, the appropriate personnel, whether it be staff or the developer. Good evening, ma'am. Let Good us know evening. who you are. I'm Donna Gallagher. 
I live in North St. Lucie County in Holiday Pines. And I have a question as since this development seems like it's in Lakewood Park, and as far as I know, we don't have a water treatment plant. Where are, is this uh, project have their own water treatment plant? That's all my question was. That's all your question is? I yes, have a, I have uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the water systems here in our, our state. Well, the, well, Florida the good news, aquifer. Well the, well, the good news is we are working on our utilities, but I have a mm -hmm. utility director here that can answer your question. Is that, is that all you had? Yeah, that's all okay. I had. I wanted to know since this was Lakewood Park and we seem to be having a, an extreme amount of problems up there with infrastructure. Uh, are they going to have their own water treatment plant? Okay, thank you thank for your you. question. Chairman, members Mr. of the board, George Lander, Utilities Director, for the record. Um, the Water Storm Project is currently being provided water from a bulk agreement through FPUA. So FPUA is providing us the water, we're buying it from them in bulk, and it's serving Waterstone at this time. Um, but that's where the primary water source is coming from. Now, what's the sewer? The sewer is same same way. There is a force main that travels the US one and then goes down US one and it in it and it's served through a bulk agreement through to the UA. So Fort Pierce Utility Authority is the water wastewater provider. As it stands right now, correct. Okay. All right. Uh yes, ma'am. Just let us know who you are for the record. Good evening. Susie Karen, eighty five hundred Indrio Road. Um, as some of you know, <coughs> Some of you that are new don't know that I've been involved in this project well before it was even approved. And there was always a concern because of the compatibility issue with the adjacent neighbors. I happen to be one, I'm least affected by this development, but my neighbors, um, especially one that has 14 acres that abut this project, which is the South Berm side. Um, what we did back then to address the compatibility issue with the high density that was approved or being approved is that they required a very high berm, I think it was a little over a million dollars to construct with a fence on it because of the compat compatibility issues. And I don't know, I think the commissioners, every commissioner at that time, I think it was the first time ever, each one had visited the site to see the concerns that we actually had in that area. The concern here is it did it became defunct. It's been a mess since day one. Day one. Promises, promises, promises. And that's just the facts. And I have been very um, involved and frustrated over, over a decade with this situation. I understand, you know, there's a new developer. I don't know if the Evans Group is still involved. It doesn't really matter. They do know what they were supposed to do. There was a bond actually put up because of the concerns that the berm would not be um, maintained or what have you. That bond was given back when everything what you know went bad during the um, real estate situation. So the neighbors had to deal with this, and it's horrible. That's what it is. It's horrible. I have pictures of it. I walk it. I've taken Corey out there. It's horrible. As far as a relationship with the new developer, whoever it is, there is not a relationship. They did not reach out. There was some outreach, and the outreach was not positive, and it was not nice. It was either you do this, or you get your stuff off our property, or we'll sue you for it. And I don't, I don't think that's very neighborly, being that they were already, when they acquired the property, it is your responsibility to know what comes with that. And they were very aware, everyone is very aware of this property. It was touted as the worst development that was approved because it was not compatible and there were issues from day one. I'm here to speak to all of you to say, let's stop this nonsense. <coughs> That's what it is, it's nonsense. I'm tired. I'm tired of coming before this uh, regarding this issue. As far as them coming up and saying, well, you know, we didn't really know about the landscape. Well, you do, because it's your job to know. When you purchase a property or you have someone that's been involved in it, you know, there was discussion with the neighbor. Well, would you mind letting us take all of the landscape on the southern berm that's in front of your property and putting it on 27th? 
Yeah, I, of course we do, because that, <laughs> that's your front door, 14 acres of it. It doesn't even make sense to me, but it seems like every time we want a new phase, on the 11th hour, as Commissioner Mitchell said, oh, we're going to make it right. Well, it's still not right. There hasn't been. There is a section that abuts the county property, which is the old schoolhouse property, and it looks great. I, I ask each one of you to go walk it. Looks great, but I need you to walk all the way down the 14 acres because you will not see the same thing. And I spoke to the owner called me again of the 14 acres this morning and said, you know, wh what do I do? I said, I'll go before the commission today and ask no more until it gets done. I understand, yes, we've talked to a new, um, from my understanding, we're going to get somebody now that's gonna take care of it, and that'll start in the fall, in the fall. Well, then I guess you shouldn't get any more permits until what was required over a decade ago still isn't done. Why does this neighbor have to wait for this? And I really ask you to go look at it. <laughs> it, it, it there are no words, and we're really trying. Well, we don't talk about when they acquired the property, whomever acquired the property, I'm, I'm not, uh, it doesn't matter to me who did. They originally were going to have to um, pay for signalization on Indrio at 27th. Well, that went away because of the length of time it took for the development to be rebought or whatever. And I think that was uh, half a million dollars that they would have been on the hook for. They didn't have to pay that. So there were actual concessions being made because it ended up that they widened the road without that because of the time period. What I'm here to ask you is to, not just for this development, we have other developments in our community that have similar situations that once you give them the permits, once you allow this to go on, guess what doesn't get done? And guess who's gonna talk about it every time? The residents, the residents that abut these properties. Thank you for your time. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Is there any, one minute please. If I, is there anybody else that has uh, come and uh, wanna have their say so about this particular development in this agenda item? Okay, feel free to come back up and answer the questions. Yeah, sure. I'll start with the uh, lady who was in front of me. Um, our, our site came, like I said, I just bought it two years ago. I was informed I got a uh, site plan approval of what was required for the southern berm where the 14 acres and I guess she lives uh, along that property. And it's specific, it says 3,000 plants, this type of plant, I don't know what kind of plants they are. We hired someone to put in the plants. I went in there with Amy Cooper prior to the last plot being approved. We counted 3,000 plants to make sure everything was there. So we met exactly our obligation from the previous developer that we didn't agree to, that we got stuck with. We understand when we came into the uh, county and we bought the property that mm -hmm. there's conditions that have to be met. We met the conditions. I sat there for four or five hours while we're counting 3,000 plants, this species, that species. So as far as I know, there should be no objection. We've met our obligation to the <coughs> gentleman who owns the 14 acres, to her property, all the planting's in, the new fence is there. There should be no complaints as far as what the county approved when the PUD was approved. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna bring it back to the board. We will close that segment. Um, Mr. Benton, I see one entrance here. This uh, site, uh, this drawing does not provide or show me a, a more than one entrance and exit to the entire community. Is there something that I'm missing from the site plan or is it does it exist somewhere else that I'm just not seeing because it's not on the Chair on Zabowski, the whole community. Members of the board, uh, the primary access that you're, you're, you're observing is the sole access for residents. Uh, there is an emergency means of ingress and egress at the far northwest corner of the property for fire uh, purposes. So that's not a separate entrance and exit. It has to be, uh, uh, how, is there a gate there or how, do, what's the? We know. So the development is not a gated community. I do believe um, there is uh, a barrier uh, for that means of ingress and egress at the northeast corner for fire uh, prevention. And I presume it, it would have a Knox box uh, flip key switch for a fire district's access. Uh, but staff can uh, verify. I, I 
believe at this moment in time it's being utilized as a uh, construction entrance uh, for uh, uh, construction vehicles entering uh, the site. Kind of a back office access. Yeah, and, I, and, and uh, there used to be a period of time when uh, we sent things up to the, the state uh, for things of this size, and uh, we had uh, use Savannah Club as an example. In their DRI, they had to they had to be uh, two entrances and exits uh, to the to the community. Uh, anyway, that's that aside. I have to uh, kind of come back to the board, and, and let me ask Mr. McIntyre. There seems to be a lot of questions, uh, unanswered questions. Uh, I, I don't want to spend much more time on this tonight because I think that. What I'm asking uh, the board to consider is sending it back to staff, letting the board discuss it further, and have additional questions and answers uh, uh, through staff so that the developer can have a better understanding. Trying to negotiate this from the dais, I think, is not uh, really in the best interest of anybody, the board or the developer or uh, the community. So, Mr. McIntyre, could you please guide me, please? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, th th this is uh, a little different than what we would normally see. It's not a new development in the sense That's that the they're they're asking for zoning or site plan approval. These these are um, the fact that it's a plat and it's the fourth uh, phase or whatever phase four. As Mr. Benton indicated, the uh, the project is vested, as I understand it. It's it's been vested for some time. The the requirements <laughs> under the law for plat approvals are. Once they meet the requirements of the plat, there really isn't a lot of discretion, the county's plat requirements. So um, if the board has questions, though, and uh, it, it hasn't answered, I guess we could delay the, the process if that's the board's will. Um, <coughs> but, but again, the board isn't going to be able to fundamentally change the, the development pattern here because of the vested nature of the site plan and the fact of the limited uh, review that you have here really it's it's a fairly uh, strict standard in terms of plat review so if you have unanswered questions there's things perhaps that the board would like to see I I think you you could do that um, but really in terms of fundamentally altering it and nobody suggested that at this point but you, you really don't have that discretion okay thank you that's what I want to <coughs> All right, uh, Mr. Benton, um, do you have a number of uh, conditions? Uh, it sounds as though we're going to be having to move this thing forward. Um, uh, do you have a list of those conditions? And if you do, will you provide those to the clerk? Mr. Zadovsky, members of the board, the recommended condition of approval is uh, specific to uh, requiring uh, that all on-site landscaping be uh, positively inspected and be in a healthy condition uh, in accordance with an inspection from the Environmental Resources Department and their sign-off uh, prior to plat recording, in addition to uh, authorization or approval of a subdivision improvement agreement and the filing <coughs> of associated surety um, for any outstanding infrastructure, which would include, as we discussed, a, a prorated share of the resurfacing of the roadway and connection of sidewalks that would be installed on a, a townhome by townhome basis uh, to avoid impacts during construction. Uh, so it is uh, that subdivision improvement agreement would cover just uh, simply the phase four plat for this uh, 152 townhome uh, lots subject of, of this evening's request. Okay, anything else from the board? So I take it you, this, that we're not going to, the staff is recommended, but this condition is upon a successful landscaping, right, inspection prior to any recordings of plots, correct? That is correct. It states it on the Okay. I'll bring it to the board. Is there a motion? I'll make, I'll make <coughs> a motion to approve. We have a motion to approve by Townsend. Is there a second? Second. Second by... Hutchinson, any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, please call the roll. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? No, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchinson? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Chair Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. 
All right, sir. Uh, your project has been approved. The plan has been approved. I would certainly suggest um, following the recommendations and the conditions. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, no other items that the commissioner is pulling for comment or separate vote. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda we'll as amended? Second. We have a motion by Mitchell, second by Bartz. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Okie dokie. If you give me a half a second to get back into my list. Next item is the uh, <coughs> public hearings. And let's see if I can find my screen again. There it is. All right. All right, public hearings. Next item will be public hearing 9A1. And thank you, Mr. Like Chairman. Uh, Assistant County Attorney Catherine Barbieri will be presenting this item. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Barbieri. Good, good evening, Chair. Commissioners, for the record, Assistant County Attorney Catherine Barbieri. And I'm sorry, I thought there was a PowerPoint up here for me. Uh, what you have before you is request for an order pursuant to Appendix A, Local Acts, Article 8, Division 2, Unsafe Building Structure of the St. Louis County Code of Ordinances and Compiled Laws to demolish an unsafe structure at 1764 West Midbay Road, Port Pierce, Florida. Under the provisions of the St. Louis County Code of Ordinances and Compiled Laws, the building located at 1764 West Midbay Road, Port Pierce, in St. Louis County was inspected by the building official, has been determined to be unsafe and to constitute a public nuisance. The building official examined the property on January 19th and in March of 2021, and the building is damaged, deteriorated, or defective to such an extent that the cost of restoration or repair will exceed 50% of the value thereafter restoration or repair. The building is manifestly unsafe and unsanitary for use as a single family dwelling. The building is in its current condition, constitutes a public nuisance, and there is damage to the roof and roof structure. The structure is not weather resistant and interior appears to be severely damaged. And uh, I'm sorry, Katie, was there a PowerPoint put on here? No. I apologize. Probably right in front of me. I apologize for that. Um, and now oh, I'm going to show you a few pictures on the building right here. Okay. And I go to the next. This is the location map. You can see where it's located on Midway Road. It's in yellow next to the river. You can see that this is the, the building. You can see the roof rot. This was taken on May 26, 2021. You can see the building there. <coughs> more roof rot, more destruction on the building, more destruction of the building, more destruction. Again, more pictures. In the previous action, February 2nd, 2021, the Board of County Commissioners declared the building to be unsafe and constitute a nuisance and authorized the public hearing to be held, which is tonight, to consider appropriate action to debate the safety hazards. To date, no permits have been applied for to bring the structure up to date. All interested parties have been notified that a public hearing would be held tonight to determine what further action should be taken, which may include an order to demolish the structure and place a lien on the property. An ad was placed in the local newspaper to run once a week for four consecutive weeks on April 5th, 12th, 19th, 
and 26. A copy of the notice was sent to the owner and posted on the property. Staff is recommending that the board give the code enforcement department permission to proceed to use the lowest responsive bidder to demolish the structure, clean the property of all junk, trash, and debris, and access, assess the entire cost of such demolition against the real property, which shall constitute a lien payable to St. Lucie County. The building official is here if there's any questions, and this is a public hearing. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Barrier? from the board? No? All right. Well, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this item? It looks like you're first, sir. Yes, my name is Greg Lyman. It's my property, and I'd like to uh, request the board for time to make a sale. I have an auction coming up on the 19th of this month. And we have cleared the property for the auction. Uh, the reason for its condition is my condition. And then the fact that um, I expected it to be sold within this year where nobody has been coming to Florida to look at anything. And the, uh, there has been zero action on the real estate, which is now ramping up. Mm -hmm. I would like permission to continue to try to sell it. I have a a potential buyer right here with me right now and we're making a deal to be ready for the auction and then she can begin building it fixing it back up um, I, <coughs> I, I have been scraping to live for four months I have you know I, I got a ride here I had no other way to get here I don't own a vehicle this is my only asset at all in my life and I have a chance to sell it. I'd like the opportunity to. And by the way, the uh, the roof is fine. That r what she was calling roof rot, those are called, uh, aren't those called soffits? The bottom part, because the roof is made out of cement. Soffits are rotted. They're what? The soffits are rotted. So. Right, the soffits are. The roof is fine. Aren't the soffits and the roof a different thing? I'm just well, saying. We're, we're going to let that to the building inspector to determine those, those statements. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, this has been in code for some time. Uh, what was the, the holdup on trying to take uh, action months ago? Money. Uh, for an auction? No, no, not for an auction. It's been, on, it's been for sale. Trying to get to sale when there's no people coming to Florida. Okay, I'm... I'm I don't mean no. Okay, all right. Um, any other testimony you'd like to provide the board? It's cleaned up. The yard has been cleaned up, ready for the auction. Um, I'll do what you request, but I just, if, if this thing is taken down, it could be years of my life on the backside. I won't have anything to live on. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your testimony. This is a public hearing. I have to listen to other testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board? Just let us know who you are for the record. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. This I'm Delilah McKenna, and um, like Mr., uh, I live here in St. Lucie County, and um, I do agree that the property needs major work. I have been talking with Miss Barberry's office and also with uh, the utilities company to see exactly what needs to be done to this property, and there it is extensive. Um, I don't believe that the county commissioners or the county would like to put the cost in to demoing it. I believe that your ultimate goal is cleaning the property up. Am I not mistaken on that? To come into compliance is ultimately the uh, the issue and yes. compliance would be uh, based on what I'm understanding is the property is over 50 percent uh, in uh, disrepair so it would have to be substantially rebuilt that is uh, correct. That is, and, and you're taking that 50% for just the building value, not the land and building, correct? I'm going to let the building inspector and uh, Ms. Barbieri answer that answer those questions. But continue your testimony if you want. <coughs> so I would think it would be in the commissioner's or the county's best interest to let the auction proceed on June 19th, which is right around the corner, a couple mm -hmm. weeks, and see what the new owner, whether it be me or another owner, I cannot guarantee it will be me. Um, I do have a lot of interest in the property, but let the auction happen and then reassess it at that point, because after that point, then Mr. Lyman will no longer be the owner. Mm -hmm. It is an absolute, so there will be a new owner. Okay, and all right, is that? 
that All we have for testimony? No, that's that's everything. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Welcome back. Uh, as part of the questions, we've heard that um, uh, will the building be demolished after um, any proposed sale? What's the condition of the property? Uh, you know, what what are some of your thoughts on that or your your experience with this property? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chairman, Commissioners. For the record, Doug Harvey, St. Lucie County Building Official. The condemnation process that we have is actually a very simple process. If the cost of repairs appear to exceed more than 50% of the value of the structure, then the structure is considered not uh, habitable and does not meet the requirements for general health, safety, and welfare. In this case, the property appraiser has the structure at roughly $35,000. In my opinion, there is probably close to seventy dollars to $100,000 worth of repairs. Now, in all fairness, I have not been inside the property. My opinion is based upon the outward appearance of it, the damage that is evident. There are uh, truss tails and rafters that are no longer present or rotted. The soffits, in order for a soffit to rot to the extent that you see, water has to be getting to the soffit somehow. I don't believe there is a sprinkler system that is blowing the water up inside. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, any questions from the board? I have Mr. Couple, Townsend. I have a couple questions. Is the, do you have a mortgage on this property? Okay, so I'm, a, I'm confused as to why it's being auctioned. If there's no mortgage, why aren't you just doing a direct sell to her if she's interested? And, and Commissioner Townsend, I, from a, from an auction standpoint, if there's a bidding war, that's the quickest possible way to go through that uh, with a final sale. No, I'm familiar. Uh, I used to sell yeah. real estate. I'm okay. familiar how it goes. I'm just, I'm trying to find a way to get there to help him. But if there's no mortgage on it, people are coming to Florida. People are coming to St. Lucie County. Property is on the market less than two hours. I don't understand why, if there's no mortgage why you can't just make the sell to her and her commit to whatever your price is and you move on. To give you an, an extended time of something you've already been given months to move forward with to come to the 11th hour to come before us and then saying it's gonna be auctioned, I'm struggling with that. So that's why I inquired, was there a mortgage or was it paid for, so. Any other uh, questions from the board? It's unusual, but something. The pictures look deplorable. I have been through the property and I have climbed up in the attic and with um, inspectors and with my flashlights. Um, there is promise to the structure. It doesn't look like it on this pictures. The soffits are rotten. That's a fact, we can see that. But as far as the property outer walls and the roof, um, there is, if you're familiar with Dade County Pine tongue and groove roof deck, that is what the attic is. The soffits need to be redone. Um, the structure outer walls are solid concrete. Um, there is one leak in the roof, and I believe that's um, where there was uh, where the um, roof vents are coming from. That can be repaired. Uh, pressure washing does amazing things to a property, and I would like to try to save it. I understand from the um, legal office from Ms. Uh, from Ms. Barberry's office. The value is at 95, if I'm not mistaken, for just the building, and I cannot improve it more than 50% of that value. Correct me if I'm wrong. So I have Jesus. talked with the county and the departments, the specific departments. They said I could do up to 45, reassess, reappraise it bring the value up and continue to improve it. Improve it. it has an incredible history, that property does, um, and I would like to save it, if at all possible, and bring it up to a satisfactory aesthetic value for our community. Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Townsend. So, number one, I would, I would want them to save it if they can, because it's a block, and for me, 
if she is willing to have this purchase price and it's agreed upon, I also know that if you take all this down and we demo the house, it starts all over again with impact fees and everything moving forward to That's start all over again. If if she saves the block house with the slab, she avoids having to pay the impact fee up front because the impact fee's already been paid on that property. And it being a concrete block house, and yes, pressure washing and paint does miracles, even if she had to go in there and put in a whole new roof. Um, I understand why you would want to salvage the property, and mainly for impact fees. But I just, again, I don't understand why there's not already an agreement between you if you're going to buy the property and you've agreed on a price and you just move forward and you've contacted an attorney or title company to move forward with the sale. The so, only thought process I would have is if he's trying to get more money for it, then, then maybe they're in an absolute auction. You can right. have a bidding war depending where the property is. I don't know where exactly it is and what right the value of that is. But let me mm -hmm. ask a question uh, of the board. Um, the 19th is literally uh, 18 days away. Right. Oftentimes it takes 30 days to take this through the process, mm -hmm. you know, another you know, period of time to actually get somebody to tear it down. Uh, and if the board were to consider uh, 30 days uh, without taking the property down with the contingency that uh, the property is sold on the 19th uh, to a new, uh, to a new uh, property owner uh, to resolve the code issues, uh, and I don't know what kind of uh, fines or and, and uh, costs are associated with the uh, actual uh, code violation at this point, because that's that's a part of the cost as well. So. Um, no, I, and that's where I was going with this. I think since it's just a couple <clears throat> weeks out, it's going to be sold on the 19th, regardless it being block and saving impact fees. It's moving in that direction. I, I'm happy we're having this conversation. I'm okay with that. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just suggest maybe uh, rather than try to get into the details of the auction, or we, we, our next meeting is, I believe, uh, July the 6th Correct. at 6 p.m. or as soon thereafter. Perhaps the board would consider a, a continuance at that point. Mm -hmm. um, if the auction is going to happen, it will. Uh, we'll have better information. These folks can come back on the 6th and report. Uh, at that point, then the board can take action if it's, right. if okay. it's appropriate or not. But I think staff would recommend a a continuance uh, to July 6th at 6, that's a Tuesday, at 6 p.m. or soon thereafter. And that's why we have you, Mr. McIntyre. Okay. Well, we still are under public comment, so let me go ahead and do that. Is anybody else here uh, to uh, testify to this issue? Seeing no movement, come back to the board. Is there a motion? I make a motion that we bring this back at the next board meeting on July 6th. 6 at 6, 6 p.m. or soon thereafter, okay. as can be heard as a continuous to bring it forward. And if it's been rectified, it's no problem. It goes Second. away. All right, Commissioner Towns, I mean, Commissioner Townsend makes the motion, second by uh, Mitchell. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Well, good luck, folks. Okay, let me get back to my screen, please. I don't know why I'm having trouble tonight with this screen. Here it comes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next item is uh, number number two uh, nine a two. Uh, Assistant County Attorney Caroline Valentine will be handling this item. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Caroline Valentine, Assistant County Attorney. Um, before you for consideration is Ordinance 20-011, which amends the Sustainability District Ordinance. Uh, the Sustainability District was formed in 2010 to encourage energy efficient improvements on existing structures and buildings. Um, and it uh, allows for alternative financing in the form of non ad valorem special assessments. <coughs> This proposed um, uh, ordinance would expand the types of qualifying improvements to mirror the Florida statutes, and it would also allow for um, improvements on new construction um, as consistent with the Florida statutes. Uh, notice of the board's intent to consider this ordinance was um, provided in accordance with the statutory requirements, and uh, this county staff is requesting that the board approve the ordinance and authorize the chair to sign the ordinance. Any questions of staff? 
Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this item? Seeing the movement, we'll come back to the board. I just want to uh, chime in on this. This is uh, really helping to go forward with our, not only the sustainability district, but our resiliency focus. Uh, not only are we looking at it locally, uh, the state is making a big investment into the future of resiliency, which is going to be important for us all going forward. That being said, is there a motion? So moved, Mr. We have a motion by Mitchell, second by Bartz. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Next item. Uh, welcome back. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, for the record again, Assistant County Attorney Catherine Barbieri. And what you have before you is Ordinance 21013. It's amending Section 31-1 of the St. Lucie County Code and compiled laws prohibiting the erection of signs and structures within the right-of-ways of any public road in the unincorporated area of St. Lucie County. The original ordinance was passed in 1978, Ordinance 78-3, which prohibited these the erection of signs and structures within the right-of-ways limits of any pu public road in the unincorporated area of St. Lucie County. If a sign or structure was erected, in the original ordinance, the Board of County Commissioners had the authority to direct removal. Since 1978, St. Lucie County has grown a lot. The census in 1980 was 87,000. In 2010, it was 277,000 approximately. In 2019, the estimate has been 328,000. As the population is growing, it is prudent to provide daily operation decisionals to the county administrator or designee to provide, and we're going to add, an, and to provide an appeals provision. This ordinance would simply change the um, it going to the Board of County Commissioners to the County Administrator designee to direct the removal and it provides an appeals process to the circuit court. This is a public hearing and it was advertised on May 19th, 2021 in the local newspaper and staff is recommending approval. Thank you. Any questions for staff from the board? Seeing none. Anyone wishing to address this item? This is a public hearing. Seeing no movement, we'll come back to the board. Is there a motion? So moved. We have a motion by Bartz. Is there a second? Second. Second by Townsend for approval. Uh, any comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Next item is uh, item B, Planning and Development Services. Item one, this is quasi-judicial. Uh, so uh, as we move forward, this is the major adjustment to the to Serta Quad. Uh, 1A final platted um, planned development site plan. Uh, so let's go ahead and do our quasi judicial. Mr. Uh, Chair, I've only spoken to the staff. Thank you. I as well, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Staff only. Staff only. And staff only. Uh, I'm sorry, staff, but I also was at a presentation with Kings Highway uh, property uh, owners uh, to which this was of great interest. So um, I'll just make that known. Mr. Benton, good evening. Good evening again, Chair Zadovsky, members of the board. Uh, Corey Benton, Assistant Planning Manager for the record. Uh, we do have two items. There was a companion item uh, associated with this proposed PNR, the site plan adjustment under consent for the associated plat uh, for subdivision of the property. But to Serta, Quad 1A is situated at the far southeast corner of the Treasure Coast Education Research Park. Uh, quad 1A, uh, and again, this uh, evening's public hearing was noticed uh, via display ad in local newspaper, sign posted on the premises, and mailings to owners of property within 500 feet of the petition site. Uh, quad 1A, which is located at the southeast corner of the Church Coast Education Research Park, uh, was uh, developed in, in 2011 uh, with subsequent completion of the Sunshine Kitchen in 2017, the 10,000 square foot uh, business incubator uh, and culinary uh, institute uh, within the, the research park. Uh, it's been a catalyst for local business growth and development. And Quad 1A uh, is uh, a key component of expanding that synergy and, and being somewhat of the anchor in addition to uh, USDA, uh, University of Florida IFA Center, and uh, various. Uh, agriculture and aquaculture facilities uh, within the Education Research Park. Uh, 
the Quad 1A uh, is, is owned by St. Lucie County, and in 2011 there was a substantial uh, plan non-residential site plan uh, laying out the future development, the concepts for how this quad would grow and develop with a lot of micro-level detail. Uh, it was very innovative, uh, very forward-thinking. Uh, however, to an extent, it didn't consider a lot of market conditions and uh, the changes in the market that we've seen over the last decade as uh, consumers demand products, services, and food-related re uh, uh, research, education, and uh, preparation. Uh, so the amendments this evening uh, that we will highlight um, seek to help implement the strategic plan for Deserta. Uh, this time a year ago, uh, June 2nd, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners adopted a text amendment uh, modifying the allowable permitted and conditional uses within uh, Zone A of the Treasure Coast Educational Research Park. Uh, and this amendment this evening seeks to adopt and incorporate those allowable uses within Quad 1A's uh, future development. Also to refresh the, the Quad site plan to create uh, flexible track development, uh, as we'll highlight in the site plan, provide for final plat approval, uh, allowing the county to lease individual lots or uh, consider selling and transacting individual lots. The lots proposed to range anywhere from 1.8 acres to about four acres. Uh, so they can be uh, individually developed, uh, small business or aggregated uh, to allow for larger uh, business and vertical integration. If someone is uh, preparing research, uh, creating a viable product and seeking to distribute it from the site, uh, there's a, a lot of flexibility in business models. Uh, also related to this uh, evaluation of staff, uh, looking long range uh, transportation improvements in the roadway network uh, as Kings Highway is reconstructed and expanded, uh, connecting the park to our region, our community, and uh, state abroad. And then uh, working with Deserta to market and promote uh, the viability of uh, the research park, but also Quad 1A and building off of <coughs> development and progress we've had with the Sunshine Kitchen. This is the proposed uh, adjusted plan for Quad 1A, uh, highlighting the initial development of the Sunshine Kitchen on Lot 2, allowing for a track development lots 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6, uh, building off of the baseline infrastructure uh, that was completed, uh, the initial private street connecting from Pruitt Research Road to the south, the Master Storm Water Pond and System, and the continuation <coughs> of sidewalks within uh, the project. This adjusted plan uh, essentially provides a clean slate and allows for each uh, lot to be developed uh, in accordance with uh, our land development code through a minor site plan process, maintaining key principles, permitted uses in alignment with the land development code, maximum height, maximum building coverage, uh, concurrency review for transportation, utilities, uh, ensuring that uh, adequate public facilities are supporting the project and capping uh, the maximum impervious area in alignment with the prior plan and verifying that there will be uh, allocated green and open space consistent with the prior approval. So the development of the 30 acres uh, is consistent with the Tesserta the strategic plan, the land development code, and the original uh, plan non-residential development for this project. And again, long term, as the park grows and development needs uh, provide a connection of Graham Road and Exploration Way in the future as more infrastructure needs uh, come about. But uh, for the, the scope of development uh, considered within Quad 1A, uh, the access and the internal street network as designed would serve the, the project. So again, future track development, maintenance of open space, and again, continuation of uh, the existing Sunshine Kitchen and allowing uses that are complementary, uh, implementing uh, to serve as adopted design guidelines uh, to support future track development. So uh, this evening's adjustment for the Quad 1A plan uh, would incorporate the expanded uses adopted in the Land Development Code, delineate the proposed lot boundaries, the seven private developable tracks in addition to the open space, allow for future uh, phases in development to be eligible for a minor site plan review uh, with administrative uh, approval capacity, as long as it's consistent with the approved uh, PNRD plan to start a design manual and other land development code guidelines. Update the retention pond boundary uh, that was modified based upon the as built um, and the, the affirmed stormwater capacity to serve the impervious area presented. Uh, 
continuation of the internal street design within Quad 1A uh, with the uh, interim uh, cul-de-sac and then the future connection extension north to Graham Road, uh, encouraging interconnectivity for this project. And again, lastly, the update to the Quad 1A design review standards manual, which uh, highlights uh, keys related to architecture, design, uh, limiting of outdoor storage, ensuring that, that the, the park uh, grows and maintains uh, an appropriate appearance uh, that uh, typifies the, the entrance to uh, the Church Coast Educational Research Development Park. And the associated plat uh, reaffirms uh, the proposed track development, highlighting the seven uh, lots that uh, would the county would have discretion to sell or lease and allow for individual or aggregate development across those depending upon the business needs, ensuring alignment with the overall mission and strategic plan of Caserta. Based upon consistency with the county's land development code, the comprehensive plan and substantial conformity with the previously approved plan on residential site plan, staff is recommending this board approve the adjustment and the associated plat. Uh, the plat with conditions uh, requiring a subdivision improvement agreement and surety prior to plat recording in accordance with our land development code. Okay, thank you, Mr. Benton. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this item, please come forward. Seeing no movement, we'll come back to the board. Is there a we motion? Have approval. Approval. We have a motion by Hedgeson, second by Townsend. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Next item is item uh, 8B2, text amendment to land development code for recreational vehicles. This is a quasi-judicial item. If we'd like to have your disclosures at this time, Commissioner Hutchinson. Mr. Chair, I've, not sp I've only spent the staff. Well, Actually, Mr. Quasi. Chairman, this is a legislative item. It says quasi-judicial on the agenda, but I believe it's a text amendment. Is that right? Yes. Okay. okay. So it is It is legislative. Thank you. We'll correct that. That's right. All right. Good evening. Good Hi, Linda. Evening, uh, Chairman. Uh, Can you pull your microphone down to you? It's Sorry. Over. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Corey, of course, is here, and the chair's kind of low, too. <laughs> Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, for, uh, for the record, my name is Linda Pendarvis, Planning Manager with the Planning and Development Services Department, presenting a county-initiated text amendment to Land Development Code Section 71016Q for Recreational Vehicle Park Supplemental Standard. In accordance with public notice requirements, outlined in section 11003 of St. Lucie County Land Development Code. Public notice was advertised in St. Lucie County News Tribune on May 6, 2021. In 1992, the county's uh, commissioners adopted provisions to allow single family residential homes to be constructed as a permitted use within recreational vehicle parks. Following the adoption to permit the residential uses Within recreational vehicle parks, the county adopted an ordinance clarifying building code requirements within flood hazard areas. The language that was adopted in 1996 stated in those instance, instances where the lowest structural member of the first habitable floor is located five feet or more above finished grade, the outside perimeter walls may not include any solid foundation. Perimeter and interior walls at or below the minimum base flood elevation for the area in which the new construction or improvement is taking place. Exterior or perim perimeter lattice works may be affixed to the outside walls below floodplain, provided that the lattice openings are a minimum of 12 inches by 12 inches wide with a maximum separation of 4 inches, which limited the construction. Uh, that is currently be allowed under the Florida Building Code. The proposed text amendment will eliminate the reference that outside walls below floodplain must be open throughout the entire structure and may only permit lattice openings. Since the adoption of the 1996 Land Development Code requirement, the Florida Building Code has adopted the flo flood resistant construction chapter that address acceptable types of construction within the flood hazard area. 
Specific requirements for enclosures below elevated buildings are based on flood zone. All enclosure, enclosure walls must have flood openings, including walls intended to break away under wave loads for specific zones and applications. Enclosures under elevated buildings are to be used only for parking, building access, or limited storage. The St. Lucie County building official will ensure that building plans specify these enclosed areas are only for those permitted uses out, out, as outlined in the building code and reference standards. The proposed text amendment recognizes and propose, provides criteria to guide residential construction for flood hazard within recreational vehicle parks. All on-site construction must meet the applicable flood damage prevention regulations and the Florida Building Code. Staff finds that to meet, finds this petition to meet the standards of review as set forth in 110603 of St. Lucie County Development Code and is not in conflict with goals, objectives, and policies of St. Lucie County Comprehensive Staff Plan. This is the first of two required public hearings. Staff requests board authorization to schedule the second public hearing for the Land Development Code text amendment to revise the guidelines governing residential <coughs> construction within recreational vehicle park, parks to the July 6, 2021 Board of County Commissioners. Please staff's presentation. Great, thank you. Any questions of staff? Hearing none, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this item? Seeing no movement, we'll bring it back to the board. We have a motion to move it to the July 6 meeting yes. for the second uh, hearing. Second. Right. We have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, I don't believe we move to July 6. 6 p.m. or soon thereafter can be. <coughs> um, next item, item three, com comprehensive text amendment amending the port sub uh, element to incorporate the 2020 port master plan. Welcome good, back. Good evening again, Chair, members of the board. Uh, this evening's uh, request is an adoption hearing for the Port master plan and incorporating it within the county's comprehensive plan, specifically the port sub element. Uh, since the April 6th uh, transmittal hearing that the board accepted uh, that proposal, uh, staff distributed the proposed uh, text amendment uh, to the Department of Economic Opportunity and corresponding agencies, including the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, Florida Department of Transportation, <coughs> City of Fort Pierce, Fort St. Lucie, as well as uh, the St. Lucie Village. Township. Uh, we've received uh, positive feedback to date, uh, and this evening's uh, request is to adopt the, uh, the text amendment via the proposed ordinance, uh, finalizing our efforts uh, throughout 2020 uh, to update the port master plan uh, to guide our, our vision and future for the port area to create a diverse working waterfront that benefits our community both economically and socially and provide a roadmap to uh, achieve uh, success both in public and private uh, collaborations for, the, for our community. Very good. All right, we've heard this uh, several times. Any questions of staff? Hearing none, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board? Seeing no movement, bring it back to the board. Mr. Chair, before we go any further on this, and I'll be more than happy to make a motion to close it. Um, I've spoke with staff on this, but I would like to just reiterate publicly we are now at the end of what we have to do, and then I ask and encourage the city of Fort Pierce to do what we ask them to do, because it is my understanding there's been little to no official movement in front of their board. So. And I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Hutchinson with a statement of action and second by Townsend. Any other comments or questions from the board? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And, Thank and you. Mr. Benton and your staff and all of the uh, public uh, input that you've received <coughs> and have taken during difficult times, I just want to commend you and uh, everyone who was involved. Very good work. And uh, mm -hmm. appreciation of the community, too, for the collaboration and input. Exactly. Probably one of the most comprehensive <laughs> ever had. Well, I'm with you. All right. Well, moving on to number four. Good evening. We're going evening. through the whole staff tonight, Leslie. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. 
For the record, my name is Jody Netwick with the Planning and Development Services Department, presenting 9B4, a County Initiative Comprehensive Tax Amendment for open space requirements for planned development projects. While working on the tax amendments aimed to make the planned development process more attractive to future developers, staff identified the open space ratio requirements within the comprehensive plan was inconsistent with the language in the land development code. This amendment is simply just a cleanup language. In accordance with the public notice requirements outlined in section 11.00.03, of the St. Lucie County Land Development Code, public notice for this item was advertised in the St. Lucie News Tribune on Friday, May 21st, 2021. The Comprehensive Plan Amendment seeks to amend the minimum 35% open space standards for all planned development projects to, allow, to align with the appropriate percentages identified within the Land Development Code. As previously, sta previously stated, there is inconsistent between the county's comprehensive plan and the land development code. Comp plan policy 1.1.8.1.B currently requires a minimum open space ratio of 35% of the gross site area for all planned developments. While the land development code states that open space requirements for planned non-residential developments less than 10 acres shall be 20% of the gross site area. On May 19, 2021, staff received a letter of no objection from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. This is the strike through and underlying language being proposed within the amendment, which simply eliminates the 35% open space ratio and allows for the ratio of open space within planned developments to be regulated by the language within the Land Development Code. Staff recommends the Board approve the adoption of the Comprehensive Plan Text Amendment and forward to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity to allow open space requirements for planned developments to be regulated through the language within the Land Development Code. This concludes my presentation. I am available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Seeing none. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board on this item? I see movement. Good evening, sir. Good evening. For the record, Lee Dobbins. Um, I'm here uh, as a representative of the uh, task force of the EDC and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I spoke here before you guys, uh, before the, uh, the transmittal hearing on this a while back. Um, just wanted to... Um, remind you guys that uh, the task force, the EDC and the chamber are behind this amendment. Um, it's very important in terms of uh, making PNRD a workable zoning that can actually be used for business, um, and for industrial parks, commercial uses, those types of things, um, where it, whereas it has not been used in the past. Um, thank you again to, to staff for bringing it forward. That's all I have thank to say. You. Thank you and thank you, you for, your, Let me know. for your work on the uh, task force and it has been a collaborative effort between the Board of County Commissioners, our staff and the public, uh, which has made uh, St. Louis County the much better in a process of how we get through development projects that are uh, appropriate today, where maybe in the 80s, 90s, uh, early 2000s, that were not uh, maybe appropriate then, but not so much today. So. Got an industrial park client that I think is ready to file under the new PNRD right now. So. Okay. It's going to get used. All right. Well, thank you for your time. And this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this item? Seeing the move, we'll bring it back to the board. Mr. Any Chair, a motion to approve. We have, second. We have a thank motion you. to approve by Mitchell, second by Townsend. Uh, one moment. I just want to ask a question because um, we, we talk in this position, and I'm going to talk about it in the next item, uh, but uh, about consistency. So I just want to keep in your mind that we talk about consistency in this text amendment about how it appropriately uh, works with the, uh, with, the, with the code. So I'll be bringing back this conversation in the next item so we continue to talk about the consistency. So we have a motion and a second. Any other com comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Very good work. Thank you. Next item is 9B5. Right. 
getting down in the uh, order here. We're <laughs> getting ready for the cleanup batter. <laughs> Save the best for right, last, right? How <laughs> <laughs> about that? <laughs> All right. Two mics here tonight. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Ben Balser, Assistant Planning and Development Services Director for the record. This item before you tonight is the adoption hearing for the Land Development Code text amendment that looks to implement the recommendations made by the Development Review Task Force and the St. Lucie County Chamber of Commerce. The overarching goal of this ordinance is to expand upon the allowable administrative approvals to streamline the development review process, as well as increase the appeal of the non-residential and planned mixed-use development process, which leads to superior quality projects through the encouragement of flexibility and creative design options. In accordance with public notice requirements outlined in section 11.00.03 of the St. Lucie County Land Development Code, public notice for this item was advertised in the St. Lucie News Tribune on Friday May 21st, 2021. This table provides a summary of the changes that are addressed in the ordinance. The amendment to the Land Development Code Section 70600, Relief for Off-Street Parking and Loading, includes a provision to allow up to 75% of the required parking for religious facilities and membership organizations to be provided by stabilized grass parking instead of a paved parking surface. Additionally, the amendment identifies locations where an applicant can request relief from paved parking requirements. The change to section 7.09.04E allows the Environmental Resources Director to reduce the required eight foot wall or fence between commercial and residential uses down to six feet should the adjacent residential property owner consent to the reduction in wall height via a notarized wall waiver form. The amendment to section 71018 will remove the additional outdoor storage screening requirements within the airport industrial park to align with the outdoor screening requirements elsewhere within St. Lucie County. And finally, the amendment to section 710.23 will provide the ERD director with the ability to waive <coughs> the requirements for landscaping surrounding the base of telecommunication towers if the tower is not visible from adjacent parcels or rights of way. The amendment also seeks to reduce the designated open space percentage from 35% of the gross site area to 25% for planned non-residential and mixed-use development projects over 10 acres. This alteration would apply only to industrial, commercial, and mixed-use planned development projects and will encourage the likelihood for non-residential properties to develop through the planned development process. Plan developments require compliance with minimum open space standards as opposed to minor or major site plans where a developer is not required to designate open space as part of the approval process. The code currently provides more incentive to develop under the regulations of a minor or major site plan and does not include the designation of open space or the flexibility to permit, permit innovative design. Encouraging plan developments will lead to an increase in projects where open space is considered leading to more designated open space throughout St. Lucie County. The planned non-residential and planned mixed-use development process has been an underutilized tool within the county, with the board approving only eight planned non-residential developments and zero planned mixed-use development projects over the last 10 years, compared to 107 site plan applications. This proposal does not change the current regulations intended to protect intact native habitat, tree preservation, or the county's wetland protection regulations. To address concern over the reduction in open space designation, the amendment looks to increase the amount of existing native upland habitat required to be preserved as part of the open space requirement from 15% to 20%. Staff feels that this addition promotes the goal of preserving intact native habitat, improving groundwater recharge, and reducing stormwater runoff. During the first public hearing on this item, there was discussion on increasing this percentage of existing native upland habitat to be preserved to 25% in order to be consistent with the language within the tree preservation and mitigation section, section of the Land Development Code. However, the additional increase was not part of the board's motion. 
The ordinance also looks to increase the size of a project that would classify as a minor site plan and therefore be eligible for administrative approval by the Planning and Development Services Director. Currently, the Land Development Code identifies non-residential developments between 6,000 square feet and 50,000 square feet as a minor site plan. Additionally, any multifamily development, less than 50 units that does not involve platting, is reviewed as a minor site plan. This proposal seeks to increase thresholds from 50,000 square feet to 100,000 square feet for non-residential projects and up to 100, family, 100 multifamily units when the project does not involve platting. We also included language that would allow new and expanding businesses that are located on the county's targeted industry list to develop up to 500,000 square feet under the minor site plan process. The plan on the screen is a portion of the approved Publix at Indrio Common site plan which included a 48,000 square foot <coughs> store with an additional 6,000 square foot ancillary retail space. Because the total square footage was over 50,000 square feet, this project was processed as a major site plan. Under the amended language, this site plan would be eligible for administrative approval through a minor site plan. The next example on this slide is Maverick Boats Boat Group's 252,000 square foot manufacturing facility on St. Lucie Boulevard, which was processed as a major site plan. Under the amended code language, this targeted industry project would be eligible for administrative approval under a minor site plan. <coughs> the next site plan is a 571,000 square foot expansion for the Pursuit <coughs> Boat Manufacturing Facility. This expansion was processed as a major adjustment to the major site plan in 2019. And while this is a targeted industry, the approval path under the amended language would remain the same due to the total square footage of the facility being over 500,000 square feet. For information purposes, major site plans or major adjustments to major site plans are reviewed by the county's development review committee and are then forwarded to the board with a recommendation as a regular agenda items. These projects are not public hearings and do not require public notice. Additionally, they are not heard, heard before the Planning and Zoning Commission. The classification as a minor or major site plan does not alter the review standards used by county staff to formulate their recommendation. However, the amended language does provide an opportunity to provide improved speed to market for certain development applications. The amended code also includes the requirement for the plan development, Planning and Development Services Director to update the board on all development applications that receive administrative approval. Also, any development project where major issues or controversial circumstances arise can and will be forwarded to the board for additional discussion and approval or denial. Additionally, any development project where the applicant requests the final determination to be heard by the board will be forwarded to the BOCC along with staff's recommendation for consideration. To conclude, we feel that these amendments will improve the county's focus on providing for high quality development through the plan development process and improve upon the ability to provide for speed to market. Staff recommends approval of Ordinance 2021-14 to broaden staff's ability to provide administrative approvals and increase the appeal of the planned non-residential and mixed-use development process. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions of staff? Hearing none. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this item? I see movement. Hello. Sorry, I probably should have just stayed down here. Um, again, Lee Dobbins in my capacity as um, being on the EDC Chamber uh, Joint Task Force. Obviously, there are a number of items in um, this uh, item that's before you. We spent um, a lot of time with staff giving them feedback on it, um, not just myself, but other members of the committee, which uh, include um, some of our local land planners like um, Brad Curry and Brian Nolan. We work with staff um, a lot on these uh, comments. We feel like we could package their very good items in here that will be helpful in moving things forward through the process while at the same time not changing standards or largely just um, making it more streamlined in that vein. Okay. Have any questions of the members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Motion to approve. 
Uh, I have a couple questions of staff, if you don't mind. I appreciate that. Uh, when we were here last, I, I talked about the idea uh, of um, the 20% uh, going to 25%, and, and I raised the issue in the last item because we talk about 25% uh, preservation. And so if we can maintain the same language so that it's consistent throughout, so the developers have this really clear understanding as to what they're looking for and what they're going to do, uh, I think it makes it more sense. The other is uh, if that were to be done, if it was approved by the board, uh, would it align with, align with the county's tree preservation requirements in code six? I wanted to go back and take a look at that and, and I thank you for your help in finding that. Uh, if you preserve and restore or restore 25% of the intact uplands, uh, does that satisfy the tree mitigation? Because a lot of the tree mitigation becomes a part of contention when these projects are coming through. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, I don't. I see Jen McGee is coming up to uh, oh. talk on that. Well, she didn't want to sit by you guys. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioner. Um, Jennifer McGee, uh, Environmental Regulations Manager for the record. Um, yes, that is correct. The alternative mitigation method, which is staff's preferred method because it actually um, preserves intact habitat as opposed to individual inch by inch tree mitigation, um, is set at 25% of any existing habitat on the site. So ERD um, recommended that the um, existing habitat set aside also <coughs> be increased to 25% to be consistent with that section of code. So that is consistent with both sections Correct. of code? Correct. Okay. All right. And and then from a tree mitigation standpoint, I know that that's always a point of contention. Is there anything you want to share about the tree Yeah, the other um, benefit to doing the habitat set-aside option is that it requires a preserve area monitoring and management plan, which I know is one of the board's concerns, is the long-term management of things that we require and set aside. Um, so the other benefit of aligning that with the habitat set aside is that we will have a um, document to ensure that that habitat is managed in perpetuity and taken care of, um, as opposed to individual inch by inch mitigation, which has a lot less um, protections afforded to it. Okay. Any and comments from the board? Is there a motion? Motion we have Second. A, uh, does it include the amendment to 25% yes, to be consistent? A motion uh, by Townsend, second by Bartz. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. It looks as though we've come to the end of our hearings. I've been asked that we take a 10 minute break uh, and report, come back here at uh, 20 after eight. Thank you. How much more do you think we got? All right, thank you for letting us take a break. Uh, next item is 10A1, the acceptance of the coronavirus local fiscal recovery funds. Looks like uh, Deputy Administrator Alfonso Jefferson is coming forward. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Commissioner. Chair. Alfonso Jefferson, Deputy County Administrator. This item before you is just the acceptance and the budget resolution associated with the American Rescue Plan. Um, this allow for us to move forward with um, a, um, getting an agreement signed within the system for the U.S. Treasury. That's the outstanding item that we have right now in this system. We have to sign off on the agreement and submit it through the portal. So this allows for us to accept the, um, the grant and also for the budget resolution associated with it. Thank you. Any questions or staff? This is a regular item. All right. This is a regular item. Is there, is there a motion? So moved. We have, a, we have a motion, staff recommendation by Bart, second by Mitchell. Any comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is 10A, B, I'm sorry, 10B1. <coughs> yes, sir. 
Hey, that's my job. To confuse Actually, everybody. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to make the motion to approve this without him even presenting because um, it was the right thing to do, and I'm glad that we made that decision. We're ready to go. Oh my. I Second. agree. Okay, so we have a motion, staff recommendation by uh, Townsend, second by uh, Hutchinson. Any other comments or questions on the item? May I say one thing? Yeah, please. Um, from the time we went out with the RFP last year. Is your microphone full or closer? Okay, from the time we went out with the RFP last year amidst a lot of interest, and then we moved the uh, date to July for the, uh, for the proposals to be in, the market collapsed entirely. Okay, so we turned, we pivoted, um, and we went to direct negotiations, which were not successful. So it's interesting that everything is in the timing. So what you have now is an MRO industry that is recovering. There is needed capacity. And believe it or not, you have a hangar that even if you could find the materials to build it today, you couldn't build it today. You couldn't build it for less than 30% more. So once again, sometimes timing is everything. Great. Thank you, sir. And uh, so once we pass this, the public should know that uh, we are open for business and we'll be looking for those folks to uh, take over the hangar. I want big airplanes. Okay, so we have a motion by Townsend. Second. Second by Bartz. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Move on to 10C1. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. This item uh, is 10C1. It relates to the opioid litigation uh, that the county uh, is involved in. We, we filed suit against various companies in what has been referred to as the National Prescription Opioid Litigation. The state of Florida also filed suit uh, along with a, a lot of local, local governments, including uh, the city of Fort Pierce and the city of Port St. Lucie. In April of this year, uh, the chair received a letter from John Gard, an attorney with the Attorney General's Office for the state of Florida, and, and it had in it a proposed memorandum of understanding, and it it basically allocated the settlement proceeds or proposes if it's adopted from the various bankruptcies that have occurred with the uh, <coughs> distributors and manufacturers, and then there's other companies as well. And it provides really for uh, treatment and prevention. That's really the focus of the, of the proposed use of the funds, which I think is consistent with what I understand the board wants to do. Other local governments, not, not our county, not our cities, uh, are, had wanted to use the money to re reimburse themselves for expenditures that they perhaps made. So there's some concern at, at some of the local government levels in the state, but not our county. Um, the Florida Attorney General's Office recommends that all governments, including St. Lucie County, approve the pros proposed allocation. In the audience, uh, Cynthia Angelos and John Romano are, are representatives of the litigation team that's representing the county and the cities. They recommend approval, they're here. If the board has any questions about the settlement or the litigation. Um, but in that, in that regard, there's a proposed resolution attached. It's a resolution 21-85, staff recommends approval. Any questions of staff? Regular hearing item, is there a motion? So yes. moved, Mr. Chair. We have a motion by Mitchell, second by Bartz, staff recommendation for resolution number 2021-085. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I did have a couple. Oh, couple. I usually say that too. You do that to me all uh, the time. Commissioner Bars, so, this has been an item that you have worked diligently on well since before you got here. So please share your thoughts. Okay. So will the fire district and, and Cynthia, maybe you can be the one to answer this. The fire district is also involved with this. Will they also benefit as a separate entity? Oh, I'm sorry. That's My apologies. That's okay. With uh, the Romano law firm. <coughs> and, um, Any relation to Ray Romano? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. We're getting back into this. <laughs> Somebody's You're tired. telling your age. <laughs> um, the fire district early on it was determined, and they are aware of it early on, 
that the fire district was not a viable plaintiff on its own. So the fire district was not was not a named plaintiff, unlike St. Lucie County and the cities in the law in the lawsuit. Okay, and I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. That that's all I have so to say. So will there be a very finite um, list of requirements for us to be able to distribute this money? I mean, I'm, I'm very big into let's do something with the opioid crisis. It's about darn time. And I don't care what we say up here or how much we're getting. It will never pay for the destructions of lives and families that have not just gone on here, but have gone on all over this country. And, you know, it's just not enough. So and I will note in the agreement that was attached, Commissioner, <coughs> there, and I didn't bring my briefcase up, but there's a specific reference to the use of the funds, as uh, Mr. McIntyre had indicated. I don't know if you saw that. In yes, there. I read that, but I, I was wondering whether there would be actually more finite. Okay, well, we want you to use it in this area and this area, but this is going to be the criteria. And are, are we going, are they going to dictate that to us? Uh, Commissioner, Sorry. good evening. Thank you. Uh, Eric Romano. Um, <coughs> the uh, uh, part of the MOU has an Exhibit A and an Exhibit B, uh, which list a very, very comprehensive um, uh, listing of approved uses um, and abatement uh, strategies. So these were developed nationally as part of the national litigation. Uh, these are being distributed to the local governments and the states. The idea here is that this is a national problem and needs a national solution, but recognizing every community has uh, suffered the epidemic in different ways right. and has different needs. Uh, this is intended to be a comprehensive list of um, strategies and abatement uh, purposes that you can right. use the funds for but giving you the flexibility to use those funds uh, to best suit the needs of your local community. Um, the only other thing, I mean, we know how this affects so many of us, um, but I wanna say thank you, Cynthia, for bringing it to us. Um, I know there's been a lot of hard work. Uh, Mr. Romano, thank you and thank you for being there and taking on the challenges from a place that i have to tell you i really didn't think we would see any kind of resolution um, when we initially discussed it i hoped for it i prayed for it but i gotta tell you i wasn't um real positive on it because I have watched these corporations slide out of the wheel every time. So uh, I still have concerns about some other areas with that, and, and I think that they are going to be just fine. Um, and I'm not going to even go in up here into the way I feel about that. But I want to thank both of you for stepping up to the plate, your firms. This is something that was greatly needed. Well, thank you, and it's uh, our, our privilege and honor to be a part of it. Uh, our hope here is that uh, through continued work, we'll be able to bring much needed resources back to St. Lucie County. Thank you so much. Cynthia, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, very well done. Next item is C2, Road Impact Fee Credit Agreement. It's going to be Mr. McIntyre. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item, as you indicated, is item 10C2. It does relate to a proposed Road Impact Fee Credit Agreement with Midway Glades Developer LLC, the developers of the uh, LTC Ranch DRI. The, the LTC Ranch DRI was uh, approved actually by St. Lucie County in 1997. Uh, it encompassed 2,400 acres. It was a DRI. Uh, they were ultimately annexed into the city of Port St. Lucie in 2000. Um, there's a portion 
of the LTC Ranch lying west of I-95 and encompassing 2,000 acres. That was annexed, and there's a, a history of that. They are proposing, uh, they have an application uh, for development in front of the city, uh, m multiple development proposals, but they are also proposing to a, a road impact fee credit agreement. Uh, they intend to dedicate right away and widen Midway Road from a two-lane road to a four-lane divided urban section. Um, from Arterial A to I-95, they also propose to widen Glaze Cutoff Road from a two-lane rural road to a four-lane divided urban road from Arterial A to I-95. And they also propose to dedicate right away and construct a four-lane divided highway from Glades Cutoff to Midway, uh, which would be Arterial A. It's, it's, an, it's, it's a paper road now. It's on a plan, but it's not built. The total estimated cost of these roadway uh, improvements uh, as constructed would be over $34 million. They're requesting uh, impact fee credits in the amount of $23 million, $23 million, $70,197. That's allocated uh, in the memorandum. The Midway Road project is $5.2 million approximately. The Glades Cutoff project is $10.3 million approximately. And the Arterial A improvement project is $7.5 million. Uh, these roads are identified uh, on the Long Range Transportation Plan uh, of the Transportation Planning Organization. We have um, actually a long history of, of uh, road impact fee in, the, in our county. We were one of the first in 1985 to adopt a road impact fee. At that time, we used uh, Dr. Jim Nicholas and Professor Julian Jurgensmeyer uh, and Steve Godfrey from Kimley Horn as our impact fee consultants. Um, they drafted the language, including the, the code provisions relating to road impact fee credits. Um, at the time of implementation, those gentlemen recommended that the county liberally review credits uh, for two general reasons. Uh, one, the granting of credits for road construction performed by a fee payer mitigated any argument that the county's fees were excessive or resulted in a double charge. And two, the use of credits encouraged a fee payer to construct road improvements rather than the county, which is a better result for the county. And we've We've actually taken that advice to heart, and we have approved millions of dollars of credits, primarily in the city of Port St. Lucie. And that makes us, in my mind anyway, a co-investor of those roads, because had we gotten the impact fees, we would have built most, most of those roads. By allowing the credits, we are investing in that, in that process. And that same logic would apply to this project as well. As indicated in the current code section, there are um, there is a proposed language or language that allows for uh, credits for non-site related improvements. The example that we used back in the day was uh, increasing the capacity of a two-lane road to a four-lane road, which is in two of the instances what they're doing. Uh, we did have a, a contrary language in an ordinance, that, but we changed that in 1988. And so, in my opinion, uh, as of today. The, the fee payer is entitled to full credit for those expansions. Uh, um, and now, uh, should we change that? That's a question for the board to perhaps consider, but I, I suggest you wait until we see what happens with the current state law. There's a current bill in front that's been a, passed by the House and Senate and the state legislature that would grant a dollar for dollar credit on impact fee credits. If that's signed, it has yet to be signed, but if it's signed, that would eliminate any issue or discussion about whether they're entitled to credit for this. Um, they would, would be. So uh, again, we're not sure what the governor's gonna do with that uh, at this point, but we probably should wait before we decide what to do in the future if we wanna make any changes. For the reasons stated, uh, I, the county attorney, recommend that the board approve the road impact fee credit agreement with MGD and authorize the chair to sign the agreement. There were some changes made uh, in, the, uh, in the draft that we substituted that dealt with community development districts. I know that was the county staff concern really from day one. I know it was a concern of the board uh, we, when we discussed this individually. Uh, the developer recognized that and made those changes and so 
it goes to fairness you want the people who are paying for the road to get the credit and so if you have a cd d it's not the developer that's going to pay for it ultimately they might initially we had an earlier discussion that illustrated the point but ultimately the property owners will end up paying for this and they should get the benefit of the credit the pro rata credit again staff recommends approval any questions just a regular item i'll make a motion to approve we have a motion to approve by Townsend. Second. second by Mitchell. Commissioner I Bart. just have a quick question. Dan, if in fact we approve this tonight right. and the governor signs the bill, that won't be retroactive? It won't be. Uh, well, it might be. Actually, I think it applies. But what we're doing tonight, I think, at, at least as far as two of the three, is consistent with the governor's bill. I mean, it okay. would give a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit. So I think... Our code is consistent, but if the state <coughs> law passes, it will be consistent as well with those with those okay. two, two to four lane improvements. <coughs> now, the arterial A is a little different. It's a hybrid. They're not asking for full credit, and the reason is it's going to be in the city of Port St. Lucie, and the city, as I understand it, is asked to maintain the road. So they're splitting the credits between the county and the city, and they're taking a slight discount off the cost of it. So you notice that we're $34 million was the cost, but they're only... 23 million in, in credits. So there is a, there's not a, a total for do dollar for dollar. We might have to revisit that, but um, what we're doing, I think, is consistent with the state law. Okay. And I just have a comment to simply state that, you know, when we do the credits, um, it's it's unfortunate that it's not recognized by our friends uh, in Port St. Lucie uh, at the council. Uh, and I'm glad that we have now a, a, a report that defines and explains uh, where. Uh, those dollars have come and gone. Um, we don't get the cash in, uh, but the credits are provided and the developers build it. And as uh, Dan stated, it, it is an investment by the county uh, in the roadway system. So we have a motion by Townsend, second by Mitchell. Any other comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We're going to 10C3, resolution. Uh, Mr. Agreement. Mr. Chairman, the next two items will be presented by Assistant County Attorney Caroline Valentine. Good evening again. Caroline Valentine, Assistant County Attorney. Um, before you now is Resolution 21-136, which ratifies an interlocal agreement between St. Lucie County and Okeechobee County for drug testing services. Um, per the terms of the interlocal, the county will provide drug testing services to Okeechobee drug court participants um, at the Okeechobee lab, and Okeechobee County will um, subsidize the cost of those drug testing services up to $6,000 from the Drug Abuse Trust Fund. Um, staff recommends that the board ratify the April 1st, 2021 <coughs> interlocal agreement. Thank you. This is a regular... Uh Item is there? Move approval. We have a second. We have a motion by Townsend, second by Hutchinson, with a question, Commissioner Burns. <laughs> um, the only question I have is, I thought that in the in the drug testing, the um, the person getting drug tested paid for that. So there is an over and above. Is that what you're telling me? I believe how it works in this particular case, there's certain participants that may qualify for this subsidy or this grant, um, but uh, the exact details, I'm not sure. I just know that there is a certain cost that will be paid for through this drug abuse trust fund. Um, Mr. McIntyre? Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. I think uh, the way I understand the, the drug testing goes, if you are if you have the ability to pay, you, you pay, but there's a, f a fair number of folks that are, are not able to. And, and so we get actually a grant from the Drug Abuse Trust Fund, and we use it for drug testing, mm -hmm. and presumably Okeechobee does the same thing. But it, it really depends on ability to pay. But we, we don't deny service to anybody. It's a, it's a pretty important tool for the court. Absolutely. Uh, I, I was just asking the question, so thank you. And okay. it does cover certain tests, whereas other tests are not covered, so the panels, there. The panel testing? 
Yes, it's a the, second panel. The testing. testing has gotten much more extensive as the um, as the drugs have come out mm -hmm. and been changed and altered. And True. Thank you okay. for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item. So the next item for your consideration is a proposed settlement settlement agreement with the city of Port St. Lucie and the county. And this relates to the purchase of uh, by the city of Port St. Lucie of certain city center parcels that are currently held um, by a court appointed receiver since 2015. Um, according to the tax collector, the county is owed um, past due t property taxes on that on those parcels in the amount of $427,304.80, not including interest. And the proposed settlement agreement provides that the city will um, pay those property taxes, the, um, the principal amount, um, within 10 years of the date of the settlement agreement. And the county agrees to allocate those funds to certain projects, those being the Midway Road Widening Project, um, the Midway Road Turnpike Interchange Project, and or any other project improving a county road located within city limits. Um, at this time, staff recommends that the board approve the settlement agreement as drafted by the county attorney and authorize the chair to sign the agreement. Okay, any questions of staff? Motion to approve. We have a motion by Bartz. Second. Second by Townsend. Uh, comments or questions on the item? Um, I just simply want to again repeat this again is a positive relationship that we have with Port St. Lucie uh, to finally move that project uh, off the ground, so to speak, and get some. Uh, Get some buildings on those sites. So long, again. long time coming, um, and in receivership for a long, long time. So it's glad. To, I'm glad to see that we've got some progress there. Very good, <laughs> Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I would add too that you know we we talked earlier about being an investor, and I think that applies here as well. The the 480 some thousand dollars that we're foregoing in in interest is an investment uh, as in uh, city center getting back on its yep. feet. So it's yeah, just, cool. just the right way to look at it. Okay, so we've heard the motion uh, and the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Aye. Next item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item is 10C5. It relates to a proposed resolution that, if adopted, would provide for the borrowing of not exceeding $45 million to provide for the construction of certain roads. Those roads are widening a Midway Road from Selvitz Road to Jenkins Road, and extending Jenkins Road from Midway Road to Glades Cutoff. The total estimated cost of those road projects is about $35 million. How much? $35 million. Here in our notes it says $45 million. Uh, that's yeah, the total uh, bond uh, issue. Total but bond. Okay, I'm sorry. It is, uh, and I apologize for the confusion, Commissioner. We, what we try to do is, is ask for authority more than what the actual cost is, right. because there's a borrowing cost yeah, as okay. well. You have an, Sometimes there's prepaid interest, there's bond council costs, financial advisor. So you always ask for more so you don't have to come back. But the estimated cost is $34,900,000. And again, that's just an estimate at this point in time. The board indicated some uh, desire to accelerate projects uh, along the corridor with Port St. Lucie. Uh, these are certainly meet that, that criteria. Attached to the memorandum is a copy of a draft resolution providing for the issuance of not exceeding $45 million of improvement revenues bonds. The proposed security for these bonds would be uh, road impact fees that are legally available to pay for the cost of this project, as well as a, a backup covenant to budget and appropriate. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. Any questions of staff? We will approve. Second. Second. We have a motion by Hutchinson, second by Townsend. Any comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Looks like we're getting to the end. Mr. McIntyre? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item is uh, 10C6. It relates to a proposed uh, settlement agreement with EFTX. It has uh, two components to it, really. Uh, there's there's a, uh, a code, a uh, series of code actions. <coughs> that are ongoing, uh, that I'm not going to go into any detail. It's, it's set out in the, in the memorandum. 
And there's also a beach renourishment component that I'll go into a little more detail on because it's, it's perhaps uh, needs, uh, it's a little more relevant to what we're doing. Uh, the proposed beach renourishment project is on South Hutchinson Island. We've actually, um, we, need, we needed 47 uh, permanent easements from property owners fronting on the island. Uh, we have 46. The, uh, the last one is uh, the, the property owner EFTX. Um, we have been attempting to get a permanent easement. We've been negotiating um, with uh, the owners of that. Um, we, we were unable to get actually a permanent easement, but they were willing at one point to sign a, a temporary easement, which would mean that we would need to acquire later, some in the future before the next project, a, a permanent easement. So it really just defers action. In addition, we were also working on a proposed settlement that would have um, eliminated the code cases. Uh, we, we proposed that the there's a parking lot involved uh, that would have been improved with an all-weather surface uh, for certain th items. There would be landscaping, stormwater, uh, and in return that we would dismiss our litigation and waive any fines. Uh, that was the proposal that was sent. Uh, we did receive a counter proposal. The counter proposal from uh, EFTX indicated that uh, EFTX would sign a temporary, not a permanent easement, uh, but the county would rescind all fines and liens and close our cases, but they, EFTX would not construct any improvements to the vacant lot. Um, and then they would dismiss the, their appeals of the suits uh, without prejudice, which means they could refile. Um, from my perspective, um, I believe that the, the set, settlement offer, the counter, was is unacceptable to me, and I recommend that you deny it. I, they propose a temporary easement. We really need a permanent easement, just like we got from the other 46 property owners. They propose that we waive code enforcement fines, but they're unwilling to correct the code violations. At this point, I recommend that we explore with the Corps whether alternative exists, and in fact, we've done that. Um, We've determined uh, that the Corps uh, will be uh, willing to allow us to construct the project without an easement at this point. That is subject to uh, review at the end of the hurricane season, but right now they've, they've indicated that they will be able to do that. In any event, the county attorney recommends that we reject the settlement offer. Thank you. Any questions of staff? There's a recommendation of staff to deny. Is there a motion? Mr. Mr. Chair, before I'll make the motion on this one, and it'll be in favor of the staff's recommendation, but I just want to go on record saying that the hard work that was put forth by our staff from the Attorney's Office, Administration, and Josh was remarkable. Amen. And the fact that we were able to have a conversation with the Corps, as you all know, this was a time-sensitive project, and we were down to the wire. And the core actually came through. So I will brag about them when it's well deserved. And this time it was. Um, so my thanks to Tim Murphy and the Colonel and everybody else involved as they were having their own issues with it, getting an approval. So, Mr. McIntyre. Mr. Chairman, in addition to the staff members, I also want to um, recognize planning staff. Uh, they worked hard on a revised Thank site plan. Um, in, try, in an attempt to try to work this out. And I also want to compliment uh, the owner of the restaurant, Kyle G's. He would work with us in, in an attempt to try to, to get this done. And, and so we appreciate his efforts. And also there were other third parties that were also working in good faith to try to get this done. Everybody was, was doing their best on this, but we just weren't able to get there no, through no fault of staff or any of the people that we've mentioned. Mr. Townsend. Uh, I, mean, I, I I also want to recognize you, Franny, because it's your relationship that you've had with the Corps through time. You have a, they have a lot of respect for you, and you never gave thank up, you. and you persevered, and I think you need to be recognized as well, so thank you. Thank you. I'll second the motion. We have a motion by Hutchinson, second by Townsend. Any comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Okay, getting down to the end. Uh, we are now on to 10D1, Public Works. It looks like Mr. Dane's coming to the table. Good evening, Patrick. Good evening.
evening, Commissioner Zadowski, uh, Commission members. Before you tonight is a request to waive a portion of the county's purchasing manual as it relates to a currently advertised request for qualifications for professional design services. The text that's in our purchasing manual states that any professional consultant that contracts with the county as to the feasibility of any county project shall not be eligible to participate in any future design work on that project. Um, this is a clause that is in our own purchasing manual and it is waivable. It can be waived by a majority vote of the, the county commission. Uh, that's why we're here uh, today. Uh, the design of the Jenkins Road segment between Glades Cutoff and Midway Road is currently advertised. It's out for RFQ right now. Um, the responses are due next week on June 9th. This is one of the two projects that was just covered in the bond validation hearing that Mr. McIntyre just covered a few items ago. So while this roadway project is not currently anticipated to utilize any federal funding, uh, we're looking to do this all with, with um, county dollars, we want to make sure that we ensure compliance with all aspects of the federal guidelines in order to preserve and protect the board's ability to seek federal funding in the future. We don't know what the landscape might do in the future, and it's good to have that option. Um, regarding federal guidelines, when they talk to the selection of architects and engineers, there's, there's a U.S. code called the Brooks Act, which requires fair and open advertising to any and all uh, consultants and purely bases the selection on competence and ability. Uh, you cannot use cost, you cannot use proximity, you can't use any of those types of variables to make your selection. So we feel that in the interest of complying with this Brooks Act, uh, staff recommends that the board waive paragraph 2.3.b of the purchasing manual and allow any consultants to submit qualifications. And I'm here for any questions, thank you. Any questions of staff? Hearing none. Motion to approve. We have a motion by Bartz. Second. Second. Second by Townsend. Any comments or questions on the item? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Looks as though we come to the end of our agenda. Uh, Mr. Mac I mean, Mr. Uh, Tipton, is there anything you'd like to share from announcements wise? Mr. Chair and, and Commissioners, we have an informal meeting at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, here in these chambers to primarily discuss the board's areas of possible interest in allocating the funds from the American Recovery Plan. At our next regular meeting, uh, we will be taking some time off uh, primarily to pull the budget together, but our next regular meeting will be uh, July 6th. Mr. Chair, can I? Yes, Mr. Tom. I just, I just want to, um, on the AFTX thing, um, and I've had a couple other issues come up in the last two weeks, and I just want to publicly say thank you to Representative Trabolsi's office for um, what she has done and some work with the law library and as um, also, Josh knows that Stephen Lighton, who was the chief of staff for Congressman Mast, he was trying to um, also assist us with that. So I think it's important to also um, recognize our legislators that are out, th out there partnering with us. I don't think they get thanked enough because they really do partner with us when we need them. Thank you, Commissioner Townsend, for bringing that up. We all got busy thanking things and unfortunately, you always forget somebody. Yeah, no, I know. But and I just was, wanted to bring them up. You were correct. They, they, they very, tried. very helpful. Yep. Uh, we had a special agent, Aquaman, on it too, so that was a whole yeah. other thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, you all would have been proud of the conversation, and, and Howard and Dan can testify to this with the core. It was like zoomed in, not moving, not budging, <laughs> very to the point. And kudos to Josh. He did a great job. He did. We appreciate you, Josh. We do. Thanks, guys. All right. <laughs> if there's nothing further, we are adjourned. <clears throat> we'll come to order St. Lucie County Erosion District. First on the agenda is general public comment. Seeing none, we'll move to the minutes, approval of the minutes of May 4th and May 18th. Second. It's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Moving to today's consent agenda. And as a correction, number two has been pulled. Under B2. Move <clears throat> approval as amended. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Is there a motion for adjourn? Adjourn. We'll come to order the uh, regular meeting of the Mosquito Control District on Tuesday, June 1st. Uh, any general co uh, public comment? 
Seeing no general public comment, we'll close public comment. And I'll, I'll move for approval of the minutes of the May 18th Mosquito Control District. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify aye. by saying aye. Motion carries. Motion to approve the consent agenda warrants 33 and 34. Move that approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 There are no regular scheduled uh, items on the regular agenda. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Congratulations, you called it right. Didn't I? <laughs> <laughs>